to my Let's Read Homesuck series. My name is Brodimus. Excuse me while I do this for the millionth time in a fucking row. Go and, uh... Uh, go to the Discord and let people know that we are, in fact, live. Um, because I, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing all the time. Oh, that's where that is. That's good to know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So how's everyone doing? Hope everyone's doing okay. Where's the content alert? Um, now live with more Homestuck. Oh, I should do it at everyone. At everyone. If I could spell properly. Hey, Raven. How you doing today? Glad you can make it. Send to 30 plus people. Yes, please. <coughs> All right, well that's out there. Uh, let's see if anyone else trickles in. I've got, I don't have much food today. We're out of yogurt, so I can't make smoothies anymore. Um, but I got, I got chips and salsa. I also nudged my, <laughs> I didn't even nudge the mic. I, I nudged the uh, the speaker that the mic stand or the the camera stands upon, <laughs> so it's at an appropriate level. Hey, Sarex, how you doing? Glad you can make it. So intermittently over the course of today's stream. You might see me. It's not nearly enough salsa. Oh well. I am much too lazy to go down and get more. Oh, it's so good. Not as good as my grandmother's salsa, but pretty good. Pretty damn good. I do have water, though. Each of these streams is going to start with you guys watching me eat something. <laughs> I swear. So, we are on page 5760 of 83, 8400, 8600, something like that. Ayole! Hey, thanks. Thanks for the uh, resubscribing, Ayole. <clears throat> uh, and yeah, it's time for, uh, it's time for... Fuff it to explode. Water power. Like, look, water Water is the life sustainer. <clears throat> yep. It's time to watch this, also. Not even caught up, Tressa. That's all right. You get to watch Fefita explode. Right now. <laughs> Dear sweet, precious Fefita explode. <laughs> but glad you can make it. Thank you for joining today. Oh, I should thank some followers over the course of... Uh, I want to leave it on this for I like, go and look at people who followed me over the last uh, week or so. Uh, we got Riot last week. Again, thank you. Uh, then we have Nagasha and Ghosty Dreams. Two S's on the end. Thank you for the follow if you are here and uh, present. Dear sweet precious Fefida. <laughs> S in the chat's for Fefida. Double F's in the chat. There's two F's in her name. <laughs> Little honk. God, this is an eyesore. It's awful. I hate it. Fucking Flash! <laughs> oh, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> oh, boy. So our tricksters alchemize. How long does it go for? Or does it just loop? Is this just a loop? It is the Kringle fucker. You know what? You're not wrong. Is this just a loop? Is it just a loop? I'm gonna assume it's just a loop. I can't handle it anymore. I didn't. <coughs> I don't know what I expected. You round up an assortment of ordinary household weaponry and begin to recreate a series of legendary weapons from the seven continents of the magical kingdom of Cherubin folklore. The name of the kingdom is a well-guarded secret, traded only by the cunning ninny wizards in hushed giggles. If you beheld this kingdom, if you even knew its name, you would understand stupidity no human ever has. For it is said that any mortal who listens to its melodious, perfectly absurd syllables will achieve instantaneous dumb lightenment. 
world building. <laughs> what a perfect time for that. Each legendary weapon is named after the continent it was created in, but no one in the kingdom knows which name belongs to what continent, not even the wizards. The subjects frequently ask each other which continent they're on, and as such, every conversation tends to sound like an Abbott and Costello routine. Some have even speculated that the vaudevillian comedy duo are the uh, kingdom's mirthful messiahs, but that is a matter of heated debate among the Federation of Baloney Scholars. So this was Hussey's D&D campaign, right? That was the world. The Warhammer of Zillihu! There she is, forged in fire by the smiths of Pipplemop. That sounds derogatory. Commissioned by the sage lord of the Wozenje fiefdom in the realm of the snargly Fruzmigubbins. Those all sound awful. You made the Warhammer of Zillihu. <clears throat> The battle spork of Zilly what? Plucked from the reverted utensil drawer of none other uh, than the chieftain of the Trifle Toot clan himself, polished to the gleam uh, to a gleam in the loincloth of his devoted Abracadarian butter squire, behold, the battle spork of Zilly what? The really who pop money, yeah. Good <laughs> heterosexuality to these kids. <laughs> <coughs> Mm, the flintlocks of Zilly. How? Each was handcrafted by the senior most artillery hermit of the hallowed Shundermoist Caves to be mounted in times of peace upon the royal burble monk's personal placard of dwib. Lo, the flintlocks of Zilly. How? Zilly where? Swashed from the buckles of the rough and tumble belly jape seaman and offered atop the kingdom's last known wildly occurring pluffy dimple pillow to the resplendent first. Rumby, Rumby Lump Lewifig, Rumby Lump Lifwig, of the Horse 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 Administration. I give you the Cutlass of Zilly Ware. Zilly why? Cast from the most priceless Squippy Clink Ores, or Squippy Clink Ores mind from the famous whooping, whooping volcanoes. Oh, I'm having a stroke. <coughs> Whooping volcanoes owned and curated by the distinguished Maximilian Hot Pocket Pucker Shuttle Jr. and then packed to the brim with a hilarious traveling grief miser's explosive Winkle Pork Snuff. Ta-da! The blunderbuss of Zilly Y. Hetero doesn't exist. Yeah. And then the unbreakable katana. A real hard sword for a real hard dude. It was said to be forged by a Japanese master over the heat of a roaring ma manga fire. It was cooled in an enchanted spring where virgin horses bathe. And yeah, this is still just Dirk's sword. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Fucking Dirk to the back here. Flippity dippity doo bup bup shrubber double floppy mumble scurry noodle scoop pizza bubble pizza bubble mip 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 check it out the thistles of Zilly Witch. And then Zilly Wave and Sahu. For good measure, you decide to make Zilly Wave and Sahu just to be on the safe side. Someday you'll look back on the decision and say, thank God I did that. What next? Oh. Are you sure that's really a good idea? A fancy Santa is already such a piece of shit. Maybe let's try to not to get carried away making shitty things even shittier than they need to be. <clears throat> you make a Zilly Santa. You guess that's fine, as long as you only make one. Oh fuck, you made a bunch of Zilly Santas. <laughs> Look at these idiots. I hate, <laughs> I'm just full of rage. Okay kids, I think it's time we move this along, don't you? Hello? Fucking teens. The most OP weapon is Fancy Santa, yeah. Oh, it's awful. God damn it. We're just gonna zoom in forever on the Santa nose, aren't we? Okay, we're done here. That's the flowy laugh, did you hear that? That was just straight up the flowy laugh. It's not a legendary piece of shit, yeah.
How long does this go? That's what I want to know. Is it public? Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense, Raven. Why is it so loud? I'm turning this down for you guys. Just for your sanity and my sanity. I'm turning it down on here, too. Oh, that's awful. I'm also super loud. Hmm. I mean, hey, if it works. <clears throat> News. I'm curious to see how long this goes. Because unlike the other ones where it loops, this one has to have a definitive end, right? Or not, and I just subjected us to this for way too long. While I eat salsa. Chat time we look at Santa Nos. Can't even tell it's the Santa Nos anymore. I'm gonna be honest, my patience is on them really thin. <coughs> But we're still zooming in. LSD Santa, yeah. So, y'all see the, uh, there's gonna be a new, uh, new, uh, Pokemon Snap? I'm excited. We're getting real zoomed in, yeah. It just keeps going. You can see the pixels. I'm excited. I hope it's not shit. There it is. Holy fuck. Fuck. Would you look at that? There is an end to it. <clears throat> I heard The Last of Us was not good. I heard the second one was not good. I haven't played the first one. And in my defense, I have not played the first uh, Last of Us game. But I heard the second one was not good. It looked pretty. And the gameplay was supposed to be okay, but I heard everything else, story, character, everything else was garbage. Oh, you return to the safety of Act 6, Act 5, Act 1. You finally slip out of the fabled peach birth trance of the joke bollocks and cease quaking in the food sandwich throws of the goof jester tongue, stubborn uh, though they were. Let us never speak of Act 6, Act 5, Act 2 again. What the fuck? What? Oh, wait, that's, that's, uh, that's Cali. <laughs> that's Caliborn. <clears throat> what the fuck? What? 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 No. <laughs> this might be a good thumbnail, especially considering the thumbnail I used for the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't type in the narrative prompt. You can't fucking do that. The best, worst part thing. Yeah. Hey, Gers, how you doing? And hi, Don. Also, I miss you. Sorry. Hey, welcome to the stream, everybody. You can't fucking do that. Do what? Go backwards. This isn't backwards, stupid. but it's forwards. After all, the trickster shit happened. <clears throat> no, I mean backwards by an act. Or, I guess, an act, act, act. Ugh, I hate the things I'm forced to say. And, and acknowledge as real because of you. I can go back all the act, act, acts, act, act, acts I want. The act, act, acts are kind of meaningless anyway. Besides, trickster mode was getting obnoxious. <coughs> yeah, it was. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. No. Yes. No. Let's not do the equious yes, no thing. <clears throat> it was great. It was the best thing I ever unlocked from your bullshit monitors. Don't erase the only awesome thing I ever saw these uh, assholes do, aside from dying. <clears throat> what are you talking about? I didn't erase it. It was still a thing that happened. Do you really think I have the power to make something unhappen? I would have. I would have. Yeah, I would have to be a wizard to do that. And as we both know perfectly well, magic is fake as shit. <clears throat> I want to see more candy actors, you awful fuck. Send me back forward to the next act, act, act. <coughs> Look, uh, I think we all agreed that um, Richard Horvitz. Uh, as Zim is the best voice for Caliborn. I'm just I I got stuck with this voice and it's well it's the what I'm stuck with now. <clears throat> uh send me back port of the exact thing. No way, and incidentally I didn't authorize you to send that lollipop. Oh what? You don't approve of my juju? Approve of kids doing something kinda like drugs and making dumb plans to get quadruple married and have babies? No, I don't approve of that. Besides, that's n uh that's no way to make progress. You don't just give the hero some cheap game breaking uh breaking candy candy let them blast through the whole adventure and all their personal issues that's some deus ex machina shit you're trying to pull yeah right more like delicious ex machina uh, 
Lame. Go back. No. I mean, back forward. No. Go back forward to act, 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 whatever. No. I want to see them finish their candy rump. Nope. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. You piece of- uh, No. You piece of shit. I got fucking lost. <coughs> Fuck you. <laughs> oh. oh, that's awful. Yeah, let me turn that down. Uh, oh, not this again. Stop making the thing go backwards. Why did Gamesy have to give you that crowbar? Ugh, I should have killed him a long time ago. Fucking clowns, though. <clears throat> uh, this atrocious garbage you're making me watch is never-ending enough. Can I fucking- I can't. Ass. <laughs> Without making me go backwards through acts, you, uh, you are literally the most incompetent asshole at doing this. Whatever this is. Whoever fucking lived. Put the crowbar down. No! Good grief, poor Jane. Stop horsing around and tell me how to get on with uh, my god-awful quest already. Okay, fine. The spoiled baby gets his bottle yet again. Just put the thing down. Eh, eh, eh. Got it. <laughs> Fuck me. Oh my gosh. Let me crank this up a bit. Let's, let's, leave it, let's leave it at 30, actually. We don't want something like uh, Tricksters to jump back up and in. <clears throat> Die. Ugh, yeah. <clears throat> I heard what they did to her in the fucking epilogues. Guess they needed someone like that. Fight. Now what? Caliburn, first let me explain something to you. I guess it falls on me to teach you these life lessons, because as unpleasant as the idea is for both of us, I am the closest thing you will ever have to a father. You see, teenagers are sensitive and beautiful creatures. Well, not you. <laughs> you are repulsive. But most teenagers, I mean. You can't just force them to settle all their issues with insane psychotropic game power-ups. They have to face all those issues themselves, or they will never learn and grow as people. Who cares? <clears throat> well, you don't, but human beings do. The journey itself is more important than the, de than, the de 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 destination. than the destination. The struggle is what builds character and teaches us about ourselves and about life. Bullshit. I did them all a favor by giving them my juju. They were going nowhere and being stupid and doing literally nothing whatsoever, except for wallowing in grotesque emotions. Look how uh, much great stuff they got done because of me. Of course you think you were doing them a favor. You're an alien. So is your sister. She thought the juju would be a great boon for them as well, but she was wrong. See, you cherubs are predisposed to love all this trickster crap. All the goofy, squeaky, candy-coated nonsense is a critical part of your people's mythos. The sugarized, zilly junk sort of embodies a unified field of absurd platonic ideals to the cherubim, so when you see expressions of it in reality, of course you're gonna go ape shit. But that kind of stuff is freakish and disturbing to humans. Those aren't our, our, those aren't our I ideals. What? Furthermore, that can only be seen as a boon from an, from an asocial species. You never have to deal with other people, so if you lick a magic lollipop that flips a switch in your brain that says, all my problems are solved, I guess maybe that's fine for cherubs. But if you're a human, you haven't actually solved anything. By the same logic, it's not so uh, much... <clears throat> it's not much of a boon to a human's physical journey either. Using an item that lets them get, start maniacally powering uh, from point A to point B isn't doing them any favors. I have no idea what you're talking about. It's like when Mario gets the star. You know when Mario gets the star? Who the fuck is Mario? He's a small Italian plumber who goes on sideways adventures. <laughs> on sideways adventures. He jumps and stuff and bops bricks with his head to, sa uh, to save a princess. <clears throat> What's Italian? What's a plumber? Never mind what Italian is. It's just a kind of guy on Earth. And a plumber is a guy who fixes load gapers. What's a load gaper? Shut up. Anyway, sometimes when Mario's running sideways, he gets a star that makes him magic and invincible. Oh, you mean he becomes a uh, trickster Mario? Yes, but less stupid. So for a while, he becomes flashy and hyperactive and nothing's challenging anymore. He just starts barreling over mushrooms and leaping over pits as fast as he can, then gets to the end and jumps on his flagpole, and that's it. Mario wins. But the point is, he didn't really win. That magic star is actually devastating his development as a human being. Wow. <coughs> it's a home of me. I'm coming fashion. Oh, you know, that's fair. I guess he just never picked up, like, the the hints in there, and they just went full on with the epilogues, which I guess was the natural thing. I guess I was just hoping that Jane would get more, more of a, re like, a redemption towards the end of it, but I think they just went full on, like, this is who she is, which is fine. It, having someone shitty makes it easier to compare who the good people are against, I guess? I don't know. I guess I was just hoping that since Jane was supposed to be, like, the the alpha version of John, she wouldn't end up as shitty as she did, but unfortunately that's how it went. <clears throat> uh, where was I? Why? Because he skipped over many critical trials on his spiritual journey. Mario needs to stomp on all those mushrooms. He needs to bunk those bricks with his head for the sake of his personal growth. By using the star, he is denying himself many powerful moments of catharsis. Uh. Well, I don't know. Maybe Mario isn't the best example. 
Like, I'm not sure if Mario really even has a soul. He's kind of a one-dimensional friendly cartoon plumber, so maybe this stuff doesn't quite apply to him. But these aren't one-dimensional plumbers we're talking about here. These are teens. As we all know, teens have big feelings. I can't take any more of this. this the discourse with you has, be, uh, has been even more grating and unpalatable than usual. <clears throat> you said you helped me speed up my quest, but all you did was trick me into hearing another conversation in which you indulge yourself to an extent which I cannot believe. I'm going to hit things with my crowbar again. No, don't! Jane is still nursing a wicked hangover, uh, you ass. Then be useful to me. I think I've been forced to unlock these screens and view these pointless events long enough. My quest is dumb. I want to know how to get on with the real adventure. Has it occurred to you that your quest in its t uh, limitless tedium and thankless busy work was designed to facilitate your personal growth? To prepare you for your ultimate destiny beyond this game? No. Anyway, didn't you say one time I wasn't capable of growing? Oh, right. Well, has it occurred to you that it might have been designed, <coughs> designed to fuck with your head and serve as punishment for being such a horrible little shit? Yes, yes, that occurs to me every second I think about it. I have tolerated many aggravations, and I'm prepared to tolerate many more. If it gets me closer to triumphing over you and this moronic game, I will find more keys under random ass unlabeled stones. I will watch another million hours of numbskulls whimpering about the romance not coming true. I will even endure more of these patently ludicrous act, 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 acts, even though they appear to me nothing at all. <clears throat> but, I, uh, but what I will not stand for is going fucking backwards. Fair enough. But I already told you how to accelerate your viewing. What? When? See those two panes of glass there? <clears throat> Take your crowbar and smash them. Oh, yeah. Ugh, I forgot. Is that really the only way to go to what's next so that I can put my plans in motion? Yes. You should be pleased by the irony. Smashing the glass will cause you to reflect upon a lifetime you, uh, you have yet to spend. Um, breaking stuff. Is the irony not fucking delicious? No, stop trying to bogart my shtick or playing insidious mind games and doing shitty twists. You suck at it so bad. I'm sorry. It's not breaking the glass I mind. This is the thing that involves... Shut up. Teamwork. Right? Yes, you and a buddy have to turn both keys simultaneously. It will teach you a wonderful lesson about life. Fuck! Don't act like you aren't secretly having a great time there with your new friends. You are practically the ringmaster of your own little dark carnival by now. And you're loving every minute of it. Don't deny it. No, I'm not! Sooner or later, you will have to face the fact that literally all adventures are about learning the value of teamwork. Teamwork and friendship. The two razor-sharp edges of, a mighty, of the mighty Excalibur which every hero should keep in his scabbard. Even shitty heroes like you. Fine. I'll do it. But only because the alternative, where I talk to you for even one more second, would be much worse. The narrative prompt has been locked. Caliborn, break glass. Paradox space is signed. Uh, his friend is a shitty fashion. You have to live with it. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes that's life, and you just gotta fucking cut off all ties and eat some salsa. Mario and Homestuck? More likely than you think. Smash. <clears throat> Is the, are the leprechauns up next? Calibord and Gamzy plus Gamzy engage. Go ahead and just crank this up for you guys. Never mind, I think it's done. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, boy. That's 5790. That's 5788. Number two. That's interesting. Why number two? Hmm. All right. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Does this even take you anywhere? No. Oh, that's right. It's a, it's a hash. Yeah, never mind. Okay, I guess we're doing, I guess we're doing this one. Oh my gosh, Tomei's testify began pestering Gutsy Gumshoe. Jane. What? What's this pester log? What happened to the lollipop? I dropped it. <clears throat> little little jade sounding there. God tears. <clears throat> I think it fell into the crypt. Good. Go go thus Sarah began pestering Tipsy Nostalgic. Roxy? Uh, what? I take it by that disgruntled series of letters that you're feeling about as cruddy as me and Jane right now. Yeah, Jake. Welcome to Hangover City. Population. Some extra chumps besides me for a change. <clears throat> well, I know what they say about misery and how it supposedly enjoys company. Uh, no, it doesn't. It enjoys a wet towel draped over its head. And less talking. hi -oh. Point well taken. OMG, stop being so chipper, dude. Do you feel like shit or not? 
Indubitably, rest assured, it feels like a brood of anxious vermin is making its most valiant effort to escape from my skull. <coughs> a cheeky English with a hangover, everyone. Slow clap. Pardon? I'm just saying, if you're hungover the first time, please do the experience some justice. You're giving suffering a bad name. I will say the multicolored lights on my computer are strobing directly in my eyeballs aren't helping the matter one freaking bit. Shaking my head. Not literally, cuz ow. <clears throat> Jake, here is some sage advice from a veteran of substance abuse and its deleterious consequences. <clears throat> Don't use your fucking skull top when you got a hangover, you dork. Well, I wouldn't, but I just gave Jane my, ol my only other device. I don't know how many times I've told her to keep more than one computer on her, no matter what the case. Uh, what in case of situations just like this? Oh. Why does she want a computer? Is that who Dirk's talking to now? I don't know. Maybe. She's not exactly talking to me at the moment. Not that I can blame her. <clears throat> so, best birthday ever, or best fucking birthday ever? Ha! Huh. In the interest of appeasing the irony gods, uh, let's go with the latter. Whatever role I played in ruining your party. Sorry about that. Oh lord, the last thing I give a shit about is my stupid sweet 16. <clears throat> what a farce. I was trying to act as if uh, we were all living normal, well-adjusted lives, albeit in a marvelous fantasy setting populated by skeletons. And if only we had ju uh, we just had some cake and wore some hats and blew out all the candles in one big puff, we could pretend all the problems we had with each other <coughs> would magically stop existing. And the most horrible, horrifying thing of all is, I actually got my wish. <laughs> Thanks, Calliope. Oh, well, I'm sure she had good intentions. Yeah, I still think I've been pretty lousy to you. I had my head up my ass for a long, for a while there. By the time your birthday came around, I was kind of freaking out about Jake. I thought I had the situation under control, but I didn't. Not just with Jake, but with respect to pretty much everything. I understand. Boy, you really let, me, let him have it back there. I guess so. I had a similar meltdown with him earlier. I'm not going to lie, it felt pretty, really good. <laughs> at least it did at the time. I only wish I could have stayed uh, as lucid as you during our transformation. How did you manage that? It wasn't on purpose. Actually, if I had a choice, I probably would have just said, fuck it, sugar shock my brain, please. Suffice to say, I have trouble escaping from myself. It's kind of a problem. Let's not talk about it, though. Please continue. Okay, so instead of keeping my cool like you, I just started gushing over him like a love-struck loon, surrendering my any sliver of dignity I might have earned by telling him off earlier. I just cannot believe some of the things I said. Oh, God, I told him I wanted to get buried and have babies. Yeah, but to be fair, by the time you came looking for me, all three of you were uh, saying that to anything that moved. I know, but... It's one thing to write something, uh, write off something you say to an altered state of mind. But what makes the admission so mortifying to me is I actually meant it. And I'm sure we, he must know that by now. And I, now I feel so humiliated, I just want to die. I would ask him to shoot me right here if I could bring myself to say a, a word to him. Somehow I don't think he's up to the task, which is doubt, uh, doubly unfortunate since that's literally what we all came here to do. <clears throat> Speaking personally, I'd probably run this, uh, this sword through my own dick before I could bring myself to kill Roxy, even for her own good. So... When the chips are down, I guess that's how much of a badass I really am. Whew, we are all such winners. Yeah, our moxie's off the fucking charts. <clears throat> Rox? What? Am I an asshole? No, Jake. Kinda, Jake. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I think I might be an asshole. All my friends hate me now. Are you sure I'm not an asshole? Or just an asshole and never actually realized it? Well, maybe you're an asshole sometimes, but it's always on accident. And most people are accidental assholes a lot of times anyway, so who cares? I can't believe I was so oblivious to the feelings of all the people I care about. How could I not see that Jane was in love with me? I really am a dope. I guess I did know deep down at some point, but then I just somehow convinced myself otherwise. I can't even imagine how she must have felt all this time I was seeing Dirk, and all the times I talked her ear off about how our relationship- Oh, goodness! Yup. I wonder what things would be like uh, if she told me. Maybe it's better that she didn't in the end. I probably would have just broken her heart like I did with Dirk. <clears throat> I should say something to her about it, but I'm not sure what to say. I don't think uh, she wants to hear anything from me, to be honest. Uh, maybe you could tell her I'm sorry for me? Fuck you, Jake. Why can't you just tell her? She's right there. I don't know. She's always so mad at me, I can't bring myself to say anything. I'm also just really fucking ch uh, chagrined over how I treated her. <clears throat> uh, uh, fucking, where the hell was I? I looked over for two seconds and I lost it. <clears throat> if I was brave, I could face that feeling and just talk to her and try to make a square, but I don't think I really am brave. I'm not brave and I don't think I love adventure either. Wow. Jake? You know uh, how you think you know things about yourself? Like all these personal attributes about you, as if they're written down somewhere, like a sort of mini-biography, so they have to be true. So you just believe them and hope that the believing is what makes them true. But then you spend so much time believing those things and taking their truth for granted that you somehow forget to make them true with your words and deeds. How can I truly love adventure when I never even know what it was? 
don't think it's raiding tombs and clobbering scoundrels. That stuff's fun and all, but that's not what adventure is. Adventure is... It's something else. It's doing the things I'm genuinely afraid to do, but can't. Because I'm a coward. Okay, okay. Stop shitting on yourself. I'll tell her for you. <clears throat> Jake is kind of a douchebag. He is kind of a douchebag! <clears throat> In fact, the only time they can talk on this hungry. Yeah, it's it's real bad that this is like what it takes for them to actually talk to each other. <clears throat> Jane, you know, we probably should have talked about this Jake stuff a long time ago. I, I need to move my fucking chat window. I can't fucking see. <laughs> Hang on. Toggle positioning mode. Move over. Uh, right there should do. <laughs> can't. See a fucking thing. There we go. <coughs> yeah, right? It's like, Jake, it's right there. Just fucking man up. <clears throat> Alright, there we go. Now I can fucking scroll down and actually see, except now that page thing's in the way. Fuck. Also, the fucking screen is a weird shape. Fucking fuck. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do a thing here. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna... Yeah, peace, dear. All right, all right, okay. So what we're gonna do? Mm-hmm. All right, hold on. We're gonna unlock this one, and we're gonna uh. <laughs> I can't fucking believe this. Um, let's see. Let's crop three hundred left. Yeah, I think that works. Doesn't look good though. For crop zero left. All right, things are things are things are getting fucking fucky. All right, what we're gonna do? We're gonna do three hundred left and two hundred right should be fine. There we go. There we go. There we go. Is the stream still up? Can y'all hear me? <laughs> Is everything okay? I had to adjust the screen. See and here, not stream's fine. Okay, okay, I wanted to check. I had to adjust the screen because fucking, I realized I looked over and I was like, oh, you can't see the fucking text. Wonderful, because it's a weird fucking shape. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> okay, so I think we're good. Okay. All right, good. <laughs> I was worried for a second there too. <clears throat> uh, Jane, you know we probably should have talked about this Jake stuff a long time ago. Tell me about it. I don't know if I was kidding myself all those years that there was a conflict of interest between us or what. Same. Maybe I was just pretending your feelings for him weren't a factor because my pursuit of him was already overcomplicated enough. Or maybe it was more like I was aware of them, but on some level decided they shouldn't matter because I felt like you had a natural dis uh, advantage over me. Because, you know, you're like, not a dude. But I always felt you had the advantage over me too, because you're, you, you make things happen and I don't. Yeah, well, it turns out maybe that's not such a good quality of uh, quality if you want to make a relationship last longer than three seconds. At least not in my case. I know I ripped in his uh, him pretty hard when I had the clown hair and the little soda can in my head, but the truth is, what I was uh, is I was pretty goddamn overbearing. Sometimes I look back on stuff and think I might have uh, essentially bullied him into a re into a relationship with me. Actually, it's more complicated than that. Parts of me were operating independently from myself, so it's like I was bullying myself into bullying him into liking me. If that makes sense. It doesn't really, but that's fine. Anyway. My insanity scared him right the fuck off. There were times when I basically treated him like shit without even realizing it, and I regret it. <clears throat> I should probably tell him that, but given how I just called him an asshole while wearing orange suspenders, I'm probably the last person he wants to hear from him now. Clearly, we both used some poor judgment. <clears throat> Looking bad, back, it seems crazy to me that we both jeopardize our friendship over a mutual infatuation with, let's face it, one particularly goofy kid. Can we both at least agree we, have, uh, we may have overrated the allure of Jake English? Yes! Maybe if we could have talked to each other about him, it would have helped. Like talked about uh, why we felt that way about him. At least, maybe it would have helped us knock English down from the ludicrous, ludicrous pedestal we put him on. Yeah, that might have saved us a lot of grief. It isn't like I hate him now, even though that's probably what he thinks. He's still my friend, but the extent to which I centered my whole life around a childish fantasy about him is just painfully embarrassing in hindsight. I wonder if I'll ever be able to look at him again without feeling miserable about myself. So does that mean we're both totally over him now? I can't really tell. Me neither. I guess the real problem is our clique was too small. Poor Dick was the only viable romantic target. I mean, considering our respective orientations. Maybe, just, uh, maybe we just never knew enough people? Perhaps. Or maybe we just don't need anybody. As anything other than friends, I mean. In the interest of appearing the, bitter, the 
appeasing the bitterness gods, let's go with the latter. Take the nostalgic game past your gutsy gumshoe. <clears throat> if Jane and I become good friends, with it, it, that, that's a good conversation. But that's not how things go, unfortunately, it seems. Take the nostalgic game past your gutsy gumshoe. Hey, Janie, how you holding up, girl? I feel like garbage, but otherwise fine. You off yourself yet? No. Okay, good. Please don't yet. <clears throat> I got a personal backstage pass to the Jake English self-loathing tour, and I'm in no condition to take the full brunt of his lamentations, but I'm the only one he's talking to, so... Need a little support here from my bestie. What is he saying? He wants me to relay an apology to you, because he thinks he's not brave enough to say it, like, ten feet away there on his stone bed, and he thinks you're pissed at him. Oh, man, I don't want to do this. Do what? An awkward, tell him I said sequence of apologies through text messages. Okay, that's a sane answer. What should I say? Tell him I said we'll talk about it later. Like, after we're dead. <clears throat> okay, well, maybe I won't say that last part, but Kay. Fine. Uh, how's it going over there? Fine. Not a lot of progress on the die in front. <clears throat> Don't look like Dirk much wants to stab me with his manime sword. To be honest, waiting around for the buddy murdered and uh, to be buddy murdered and or off oneself is even more awkward than you could uh, would think. Plus, kind of a drag, especially with a headache. Ugh. Jane, this is dumb. Yeah, call me crazy, but I don't think our candy adult selves thought this through entirely. Yo, trickster mode sucks ass. <laughs> Text it. What the fuck does that? I'm old, guys. Jane, you know what I'm sad about? Hmm? Fefida exploding. Yeah. Why'd she have to die again like that? She was so sweet and perfect and my friend. She would always talk and talk about the funniest things from her life as two troll ladies and always left in my spirits. Am I cursed or something, Jane? Cursed? Yeah, it's like, it always seems to accidentally kill my cat. Or I always seem to accidentally kill my cats. <gasps> or my half-cat girls, um, who are part sea princess and also an alien ghost. I don't know, maybe this line of speculation has no par particular coherence. Jane, after we go god tier, you want to, uh, to help me have a funeral for her? Of course, Roxy. I would like that. I always wanted to go to a funeral. Is that weird? Maybe that's weird. I don't know. I mean, not like in an especially morbid or gothy kind of way. I just think it would be cool to honor her memory. I never did that for Friglish, but I should have. Shit, Jake's bugging me again. BRB. <clears throat> After we're dead, yeah. Uh, Roxy, while you're at it, do you think you could relay that same sentiment to Dirk? I was thinking about all the stuff he said to me while we were all telling him to dance. And yeah, I was really being a prick when I ran away to Lomax. He was right about everything. I should have come clean about wanting some space. Damn it, Jake. After your whole bravery spill, you want to relay double apologies through me? I know, I'm so terribly sorry. I'm just not feeling up to those conversations yet. My head is killing me. Ugh, Grandma, why does your sweet skull-based computer technology have to be such a brain fucker? Well, I can't do it. Why? Because I'm sort of, kind of, not talking to Dirk either. Why not? Because of reasons. Golly, but you're talking to Jane, yes? Yeah. Well... Seeing as she's presumably talking to Dirk, and you're relaying my apology to her already, why don't you relay my apology to Dirk through her? Oh my fucking god, Jake. Jake, no. LMAO. <laughs> why not? She, she'd probably be a sport about it. Hell, they could probably bond over what an absolute douche muffin I've been to them both. El Sai. Look, Jake, you squeeze a Spanish sigh out of me. Are you happy? And if there's some heavy business you're having trouble addressing with Dirk in person, you could get Jane to relay him a message for you as well. <laughs> Jake. Jake, I... No, Jake, that's so... Alright, I'm gonna tell Jane, like, pretty much exactly what you said, but only because it's so fucking dumb and hilarious. Jane, Jake wants you to pass an apology to Dirk for him, too. What? It's true. This is just getting silly. <clears throat> I've lost the voice there. I apologize! He wants you both uh, to bond over his douche muffininess. P.S. douche muffin was his word, not mine. <clears throat> I'm being hellies, hellies, impartial about all this. Uh, we were already sort of doing that. Oh, yeah? Wait, don't tell him that. That would be mean-spirited. Hold up, what are you and Dirk saying? Oh, nothing. Anything about me? No! Just some stuff we should have uh, talked about a long time ago. Gotcha. Oh, also, he wants me to tell you to uh, give a message to Dirk from me, uh, too, while you're at it. The Crocker switchboard is lighting up today. Suspiro. Ooh. <clears throat> That is a fun fact. Thanks, Don. <laughs> uh, where the hell was I? I get distracted easily. Uh, why does Dirk, Jake want you to give Dirk a message through me? Um, because he's ridiculous? 
do you actually want to say something to Dirk, but can't at the moment? Oh, uh, not really. Hmm? Well, I don't know. Wait, is Dirk not talking to you for some reason? Is that why Jake's suggestion is going through me? Good gravy, this is getting complicated. No, well, I mean, maybe he does got a bone to pick with me and don't want to talk, but I'm not sure. Mainly said I can't bring myself to talk to him. Why not? Because <clears throat> I'm, I'm a shitty dis uh, disgrace, and he's probably so ashamed of me he can barely stand being inside the same moon with me at this point. Why would you think that? Because... Oh, you heard what he said about how I fell off the wagon and could just tell how disappointed you could just tell how disappointed he was, and he was right to be. But you weren't in your right state of mind, though. <laughs> I know, but you said it yourself about the confessions you made to Jake. Sure, you were tripping balls on a chair, pop, but that really just enabled you to do what you really wanted to do deep down. So what I do the moment Jake snuck up and owned me with the magic pumpkin? I was like, "Yo, let's get smashed in my place." <clears throat> I hardly wasted a second before giving in, and here I thought I was actually over that. But the second I'm given the slightest justification to drink again, I say fuck it. So it turns out I didn't want—I didn't stop wanting to, uh, to like I told myself, but that I still wanted to while pretending I didn't for some bogus tough girl act. Like I thought I was better than the problem, or more like I thought I was too cool and too strong to admit it was really actually really that hard. Actually, really hard. I, I added extra words there. But the truth is, I was not strong plus cool. I was weak plus lame all along. And now Dirk knows that too, and for some reason letting him down feels like the worst part? Which is equally lame and weak, because I should care for my own sake, not for how it makes a dude see me, but it still just really bothers me? Man, Jake again, hold please. <coughs> You're motherfucking welcome. <laughs> he, got, he got a custom embosser for it. <laughs> uh that's way funnier than it should be. <coughs> sometimes kids have alcohol addictions. <laughs> sometimes. Kids like, hey, man, God, you're not that late. Oh, we're already 42 minutes in. You're not that late. Roxy, Roxy, what's she saying? Talk to me, Roxy. Uh, please don't leave me hanging here. I can't take it. And I can't bear having two of my closest chums hate me and then having you shut me out on top of all that. Oh, okay, sheesh, Jake. Calm your micro shorts. I'm here. Ah, there you are. I'm sorry for being a pest, but I just see Jane there pecking away at conversations with you and Dirk, and it feels like you're all kind of leaving me behind. <clears throat> no, Jake, nobody's doing that. Okay, yeah, I'm probably being paranoid. Uh, but I've done such a bang-up job of alienating my other friends, so you're the only one I can talk to for now. Wait, I haven't alienated you yet, have I? Nah, don't worry, we're still human ad Humanated? Humanated. Oh, got it. Alienated, humanated. Stupid, stupid fucking joke. <laughs> Are you really sure, Roxy? Are you sure you're not just trying to spare my feelings? You can be honest with me. If you hate me now, too, please just say so. Sweet Guy Fieri's fat laughing ghost, Jake. No, I don't hate you. I promise you're still my bro, goddammit. Okay, phew. Then talk to me. Um, about what? I don't know. Uh, anything. What are you talking about with Jane? My drinking problems. I see. Would you like to talk about them with me? Maybe I could help. Damn, Jake, like... That is cool and appreciated in theory, but this is some kind of heavy shit for me. I really don't know if I can do double duty on my alcoholism with you and Jane simultaneously. Oh, yeah, that's probably not the best way to go. Yeah, uh, yes, probably not. Oh, how awful. So then, what else is there we can chew the old fat about? Really bond uh, over together in an emotionally fulfilling manner? Dad, you are an extra silly guy. Well... Dunno, Jay, why don't you tell me what you're thinking and we go from there? Alright, so, uh, that sure was a doozy of a kiss you gave Duck there, huh? Oh, fuck, yeah. How was it? It was... Um... Go on. It was fucking inappropriate, and yet... And yet... Oh, my view was so choice, but wrong! Wrong, 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 wrong. I don't know, it seemed innocent enough to me. What's so wrong about it? A whole host of things. Not sure in how much detail I want to spell out why exactly it wasn't cool, but like, Jake, you're a pretty simple guy, and I mean that as, <laughs> as hard ways as possible. It just wasn't right. No disagreement there, but like I said, I'm here to talk about whatever you feel like. Okay, see, this is just another embarrassing thing from my past, when I was more out of control. With Dirk, I was just way too aggressive. I hassled him all the time, pretty much every day, just like he said, about me and him, like... Getting married and having babies, you know, last male female on earth, ooh, he's a hunk, is, uh, is dreams come true, time to furry populate. Oh, this is horrific. Yeah, so, not 
uh, so not cool looking back on it. And I just had, I had no excuse. I always knew he was just such a gay dude. And I guess maybe hitting on a guy who doesn't like, who don't like girls once or twice maybe is alright or even flattering, but after so long it was probably just pissing him off or messing with his head or something. It def wasn't uh, what he wanted to hear from a friend, let alone day in and day out through garbled drunk texts. So when I fucking harassed him into kissing me, it just brought back some low rent shit I thought we'd put behind us. Just another way I completely humiliated myself in front of him. So is that why you can't talk to him now? Mm hmm. I certainly have no trouble relating to that. Yep. I don't even know why, really. He's, like, taciturn to the max about everything, but there's something about him that just makes it hurt to feel, uh, like you let him down. You really love him, don't you? Sigh. Yeah, Jake, I guess. The answer is a categorical, unapologetic fucking yeah. But I don't think that was much a secret, and the fact that it was so loudly not a secret exemplified my stupidity on the matter. It's fair to say I never came close to feeling as strong about him as you. I envy you, actually. I've actually worried at times that I just wasn't capable of feeling that about, way about anybody, about anyone. And maybe that's why I was uh, just meant to be alone. Eh, you ain't missing much. Love is a brutal shit ninja with turds for nunchucks. Be grateful that stunk-ass motherfucker's flipping out nowhere near you. Stank-ass, stunk-ass. <coughs> Fucking hell. <coughs> I noticed you nearly slipped uh, that wedding ring on his finger. Oh god, that ring. You almost scooped my boyfriend out from under me in one fell proposal. Oh, did I? From under you, eh? Wait, no, I mean... Wonks for eternity. Whoa, no, wait a minute! Easy, dude, just messing. Oh, <laughs> okay. Man, that ring, though. What happened to you, you remember? Not really. God damn it. Must have lost it when I was fucking trickster. <sighs> Shakes fist at all tricksters. <laughs> oh, this is... Awful. Did you need it for something? Need it? Not really, I just really like that ring. Kinda spoke to me in a way. <laughs> Wanna know something lame? Yes! The moment I first saw that ring, I was like in my head, thinking. Someday I want to give that ring to the person I marry. Whoever that is. Aww. That's not lame, that's nice. Now it's pretty lame, but whatever. <clears throat> Shows a sort of one-track mind I got. God, I am obsessed with finding somebody to kiss, aren't I? It is really quite pathetic. Although, the funny thing is, the ring turns you invisible, which might be my subconscious telling me something about my love life. Like, I find a guy in my dream, slip it on his finger, and poof, he disappears. Bye-bye, hubby. Oh, well, don't matter. The ring is gone, and with it, so too are my lame, lame dreams. Aww. Is everything okay? <laughs> yeah, he just wanted to make sure I don't hate him like y'all do, which you don't even... I... see. So I'm just talking, uh, talking to him a bit to help him not feel bad. Sorry. That's okay. You were saying? I was gonna say why I finally quit drinking. I mean, if you want to know. Yes! Actually, once you did stop, it made me finally realize it was a problem for you for a long time. And I didn't say anything at the time, but it made me wonder if I was, wasn't was doing the right thing before. By failing to point uh, out you might have a problem, or just going along with it and participating in lively banter anytime you clearly had too much to drink. Was I being a bad friend? No, nah, it wasn't your responsibility to fix my shit. Anyway, I think I made it hard for anyone to come at me like it was a real problem. I was always joking around so much and having a good time, like, uh, kind of overze- like, kind of overzealously so. <laughs> that I probably just made people feel like shitty wet- like a shitty wet blanket for even mentioning it. How long do you think, uh, it's been a problem? I don't know, it's hard to say exactly when I started getting really, real carried away. Just at some point I discovered a load of my mom's centuries-old booze in the house, and I didn't have much to relate to her by except her books, so I felt like drinking was a way to be more like her. Or be closer to her, kinda. And there was nobody around except the silly chess people, so in a way it just made me feel more alone. Because they reminded me I was only one of two humans left and the other was an ocean away. So little by little, I got out of hand. And one of the only things I had to look forward to was this idea that the game was supposed to be able to bring my mom back. Assuming I even decided to help the batter witch out by playing it all. Fuck! Fenestrated. Style like a fenestrated window. But it turned out you couldn't bring her back, at least not the way you thought. So what was it that made you finally decide to give it up? Well, that's pretty much what it was. When I first went to Lopan, I saw my sprite there. So I got out my bottle of mom slime and was all ready for the bestest, most poignant reunion ever. And that's when the juggalo struck. And I just knew the witch had fucked me over again, because what other hag is insane to let to get juggalos to do her dirty biz nigh exclusively? No hags but her! And I was so pissed and so distraught about that goddamn clown squandering my sprite, so I got crazy drunk and felt the super sorriest for myself I ever did. But little did I know there would be a lovely sliver, uh, silver lining to that debacle. Dear sweet precious Fefida, 
She became a great friend, and once more, she, uh, she told, uh, what's more, where she told me not to worry, that my mom would be coming anyway, and all I had to do was wait a while. And I believed her because she knew stuff. Plus, was the best. So, that's when I decided to clean up my act. I didn't want her to meet a sloppy, embarrassing mess of a daughter. Even if she did like to drink at some point, it was kind of a childish idea that doing so myself would make me closer to her or help us bond or whatever. Anyway, I think I might have overestimated her drinking habits. She sure didn't look like no drunk. Oh, Jane, did I mention? I saw her in a dream today. No! She's real young, though, like our age, and she looks so pretty and happy. Not like a girl with booze challenges. I think her fifth color must be orange, just like Dirk. She was wearing the same sunny, orangey nighty. Uh, orange. orangey nighty. <clears throat> orange nighty deal, I caught a glimpse of her in V briefly another time. And, oh, she also called me mom? Huh? Huh is right. You know, I'm not. I'm really not sure if she's actually my mom, but I do know we're totally genetically related somehow. I just think there's more to it than we know. I guess we'll find out. Whoa. <coughs> oh, what a bad time that's gonna be. The loans who start drinking to be like their moms. Yeah. <clears throat> the whole place was shaking for a moment there. What? Roxy, do you know if James felt that rumbling too? Yeah. <laughs> ah. Still going on? No, it stopped. What do you think it was? <clears throat> I don't know, maybe an earthquake? I'm not sure if, there's mo uh, if these moons can have earthquakes. Doesn't matter, some sort of prospicious lunar anom anomaly, I guess. Probably nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Probably nothing to worry about. <laughs> maybe it was like tidal forces due to gravitation or the tensile forces uh, from that big ass chain. Um, yes, let's say that's what it was. <clears throat> have you and Roxy been talking? Yes, she pissed me or something. She won't talk to me. No, not at all. And what gives? She was wondering the same about you. What? Are you disappointed in her? Why would I be? It seemed that uh, that way to her earlier, when you chastised her for drinking again. <clears throat> well, yeah, I was upset she fell off the horse. Or the wagon, the horse wagon, whatever. The thing you ride around when you, when you ain't drinking. <clears throat> but, so what? There was cotton candy in her hair and she was being stupid. What do you expect? It was a moment of indiscretion. I'm not mad at her and I'm not disappointed in her. That's ridiculous. Wanna know what I really think of Roxy? I'm proud of her. She's the only one of us who could face her problems and then get down to business and actually solve them. No one was hand-wringing or suffering in silence or any of that bullshit. She saw she had an addiction and, she, and then decided to fucking fix it. Just like that. She's probably stronger than the other three of us put together. Roxy's the best character. Just want to point that out. <clears throat> Remember way back before this started, we were talking? You and me? And I was rambling at length about leadership. Like, I actually had a clue what I was talking about. I remember. <clears throat> you said uh, I'd be the leader of our team in name and in spirit. Although I never really felt like it. Yeah, it's kind of the point. I guess in a way I was right, but not how I expected. See, to be perfectly honest, uh, we are a party of losers. Heroes make shit happen, but that's not what we do, or what we're even supposed to do. We wait. We wait for literally everything. We wait for other people to reach out first so we can fix our relationships. We wait for these legendary heroes to arrive and bring competence and, uh, comp and promise to a futile, situa uh, futile situation. Even now, look at us. What are we waiting for? To kill ourselves? For someone to come along and do it for us? Doesn't even matter. At the Four Nobles of the Void session, we do what we were created to do. We sit on our, around on our asses, waiting. <clears throat> we were all designated for a session that was utterly in inert, a place where the mechanisms for success never even existed to begin with. In such a place, it makes sense that the formal leader would be neutralized to make uh, to uh, to made feel unempowered and static. And it seems particularly fitting that uh, she would be the noble of life in the realm of the dead. A realm that foretold of a life player who felt lifeless, a hope player who felt hopeless, and a heart player who was just a stone-cold motherfucker. When we talked about leadership, and I was all on my high horse telling you, or, uh, telling you how shit would go down, I also said I would be the one pulling the strings, remember? That I'd be the functional leader of our party. And there might have been something to that in a different session. But what good is a man of action in a place where action itself is in intrinsically fruitless? So, it's occurred to me that by some tragic flaw in its design, our session was meant to be leaderless. And I'd feel safe conclu concluding that, except for a feeling that that's been gnawing at me. It's a feeling that it would be made, it would make perfect sense if a session like this had a dark horse leader. A leader who was invisible to us all along. Fittingly, a void player to lead a void session. She would be a leader not in name or in spirit or in function, whatever that means. But more of an emotional leader, who would selflessly try to hold ev everyone together while the rest of us did our best to fall apart. And Roxy's been there for every step of the way, going unnoticed and unappreciated. Think about how much shit uh, she's had to put up with from all of us. She never complains, never turns it around, and makes it about her problems. She just works her ass off making sure we all stay friends. If that isn't a leader, I don't know what is. <clears throat> so that's how crazy it is for her to think. Um, so that's how crazy it is for her to think I'm disappointed in her. The truth is, she's the most amazing person I ever knew. Uh, ever knew. 
she's everything in a human being I wish I could be, but can't because I'm, I'm in my own way. Honestly, I'm not even sure if I'm worthy of dying next to her. I think she probably felt bad for hitting on me all those years, like I was getting fed up with her or something. But all it really did was uh, make me feel guilty but that I couldn't give her what she wanted. Condi's looking. That's, that's a good. That's a good. That's some good art for Condi. Like, settle down and have a couple weirdo goddamn kids with her someday. I guess there were times I thought about it, being all alone on Earth there and stuff. I couldn't, though. I have to stay true to myself. Uh, still, she would deserve it. Nobody deserves to get all the things they always uh, always wanted more than she does. And it suddenly seems kind of stupid that I think these things about her, but she doesn't even know it. I guess I should tell her all this uh, all this sometime. Oh, uh, I think that would be nice. Of course, she is right there, you know. I know. I'm a little reluctant to drop all that on her. Looking at what I just said, it's... Kind of overwhelming. I feel like in a way you can destroy somebody with uh, effusive praise. Or maybe I'm just projecting how I would feel about that kind of intense positivity coming at me. I don't know. But I still think confessions like that uh, can change stuff between people. Like the way they uh, act around each other. Maybe it's worth it? Maybe. Or maybe it's better to say not so much of it. Like all at once. Maybe better uh, for now if you could pass a short message to her for me. If only to help kill the awkward silence between us. Like what? Could you just tell her I love her? No, wait, I mean, not in that way, though. More like, Dark, I know what you want. Uh, I know what, uh, I know what you, what way you mean? Okay, good. Yeah. <coughs> no, wait, don't. That'd be a weird mixed signal. I mean, it's true, but please say something else instead. Uh, Dirk, something's happening. Tell her that I'm proud of her. And as a, uh, and as a person, she's everything I wish I could be. I wish I could be as nice and loving and selfless as her, but can't, because I'm too busy being me. Dirk! Oh, man. The tremors are back! Big time! That's weird. I can feel it, too, this time. Hey, Look at that. <coughs> oh, boy. That's a lot of colors. If they did. <laughs> D-E-D. -D. Mm, what you say? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, look at them. Oh, you can kind of see them. My big fat head is in the way. Moonsplode times two combo. <laughs> Fucking. The pantaloons. <laughs> Why this? <laughs> and then Roxy's got the best one, of course. Also, is Roxy the only one that shows her face? Oh, that's interesting. I don't know if it means anything, but Roxy's the only one that shows her face. That's kind of cool. Look, there they are. Everyone's god-tiered now, and they're up against some fucking monsters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Oh, fuck it. Sorry, I'm tired. Mm. The beta gotcha flash. Yeah, we didn't even get a flash for them. They're just, they're just here. Here, here you go. You have some god tears. <laughs> Hi, Jade. <laughs> Zap. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, are you Jake? Um, yeah. Hi, Jake. I'm Jade. It's nice to finally meet you. Wow, um, yeah, and you must be Jane? <clears throat> Me? <laughs> oh, great. Jade and Jade are the same fucking conversation. This is gonna go well. Mm hmm. Oh, and you must be Jane? Yeah, <laughs> fucking crap. <laughs> mm hmm. Oh, uh, I. Yes? It's nice to meet you too, Jane. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Jake. Where are your pants? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, and the spring trap, uh, HIC, spring trap times two combo. I didn't even fucking read it. Oh, is this the Grimbark? 
Oh, I forgot about Grimbark. Bark. <laughs> Those fucking frowns. <laughs> Just, I love it so much. Just the... <clears throat> I definitely got worse. So much worse. Who oh boy. Oh my gosh. Gene, no, bad dog. <clears throat> oh yeah, I forgot about the corrupted Crocker. I really feel like this should have been a flash. <laughs> Obey, oh man. Oh. Uh... Jeezy Pete's. It is kind of cool. Crocker tier, that's what it is. That's what it was called. Jason seen a chance here. Yeah. It is cool. Like I like the, the format screw that they have going on here, but I just feel like it should have been a flash. But a flash is a lot of work, so, you know. On the opposite side. Fucking. Ooh. <laughs> Roxy's face. Oh, wait, didn't Thirst get blown up? Oh, I guess the moon got blown up, huh? <laughs> Roxy? <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> Just the moon, that's what I thought. Okay, end of Act 6, Act 5. All right, we can go back to regular format. <laughs> the smooch. All right, Act 6, Intermission 5. <laughs> Year 3. Dave, are you there? <laughs> Come in, Dave. This is Carcat, over. Answer me, you jack off. Don't be all like, uh, you're too busy to pick up. Who are you trying to kid? You're quite possibly the only person on this meteor who's got even less on his nutrition plateau than, than me. <clears throat> even the mayor has more demanding schedule than we do. Let's face the fucking facts. What? Did you think you can, uh, do you, <laughs> do you think Camtown runs itself? Fat chance. Dave. God damn it, Dave, I have a problem. No, we have a problem. Sky is now visible to the naked eye. We can't be much more than uh, much more than a few hours away. This is it. This is what we've been waiting for. Three of the longest human years we'll ever have to live for the rest of our lives. Sung into this depressing laboratory, by, uh, which by all accounts should never have functioned as anything but our eternal tomb. I have no idea how we're even supposed to stop this thing, do you? Oh well. Sending it blasting off somewhere at the speed of light uh, sure seemed like a good idea at the time. And now that we're finally here, after all that waiting and drama and boredom and stupid bullshit with our ancestral ghosts, and even disregarding the one hilariously neglected d detail that this meter has no fucking brakes, I still don't think we're ready for this. <clears throat> That's how they act when they turn evil. That's fair. Sigh. I don't... How do I even begin to address this shit? Okay, how about this? Since I can't think of a better general purpose question to help break the ice in literally any imaginable social situation... Where are your fucking pants? <laughs> oh. <laughs> my pants? What are you talking about? They're on my legs. I wasn't talking to you. Oh. Dave, we have a big problem here. What? I think it's time we had a... What did you call it? An intervention? For Rose? No, not Rose. Why would we why would we be talking about Rose? She doesn't have a major problem that she needs to be confronted about by her friends before she flushes uh, her whole life down the caper, does she? Uh, yeah, kind of. Why, because she likes to drink that goofy human so horrific that makes her a lot funnier and more charming than usual? How is that a problem? I was talking about Terezi. Man, Terezi doesn't need an intervention. She just drinks a lot of soda. How can you not see how that is a huge fucking problem? It's red fizzy shit water, dude. Who cares? Okay, can we just once acknowledge that we are mutual aliens to each other, and, and as such, possibly have different values and standards about things? Just this one time, Dave. Thanks. <clears throat> Terzi's made her choice. Among them was to begin guzzling down, uh, guzzling untold leaders of that putrid circus cola. Oh, hey, Brady. Thanks for subscribing, man. <coughs> Fucking where was I? I get, sounds distract me. Uh, uh Putrid Circus Cola. Think of it as like a rite of passage. Like something that just goes with the territory when someone you know uh, almost imperceptibly begins to turn into a juggalo. Wait, fuck. Maybe she does need an intervention. She needs to wake up so we can talk about talk to her about this. She won't wake up. What do I do? Did you try kicking her? Yes. I'm out of ideas. <laughs> you try kicking her. Well, I'm, that's it. I'm tapped. 
<coughs> mission failed. Oh, we'll, we'll get him next time. It's all right, Pantheos. We're only like halfway through, so we still got another hour in here. Are Tunnels playing the game? Good? I don't know. I'm mixing Roxy to chores. <laughs> <coughs> well, whenever she wakes up, we all need to have a serious talk about this. If she's in this condition when uh, we get to the new session, it'll be a goddamn embarrassment. Not to mention deadly. Need to remind you who's still following us? She doesn't look primed for battle from where I'm standing. We need to act as a unified front, Dave. We need to let her know that, as her friends, we can't stand by and watch her just degrade herself like this. Man, I don't know. Sounds like you want to make this needlessly melodramatic. Stand by, I'm putting you on speaker crab. Speaker crab? Yes, speaker crab! Man, don't put me on speaker crab. She needs to hear from you, Dave. She trusts you. God, honestly, she can do whatever she wants. I put this all behind me a while ago. Why do you really want me in on this conversation? Is it just that uh, you don't know what to say by yourself? Maybe it is, Dave. Maybe that's exactly what it fucking is. I'm sorry, I'm not a god tier. I'm not so fortunate as to be blessed with the gift of gab like you. What? That badge you earned. You know, the one that makes it easier to talk to people? Like, really open, open up about your feelings and say whatever needs to be said? <laughs> that's what you think it does? Isn't it? No, dude, that's not what a gift of gab does. Okay, what does it do then, wise guy? Its utility isn't really comprehensible to lowly mortals, sorry. You snide shoot huffer. <laughs> <clears throat> Why do you come up here so I can push you off this building? Nah, I'm putting I'm putting you in speaker crap, and then together we're going to keep it real as shit. Do you hear me? <laughs> it's just Dave's phone again. What do you actually want from her? Do you want her to stop drinking Fago and falling asleep in puddles of red fructose corn slobber, or do you want uh, her to somehow address the root of those habits and cut all that out for good? Yes, I want to do that. The latter thing. Yeah, I can understand where you're coming from, but in situations like this, I think you need to remind yourself there's only so much you can do for somebody. And maybe they aren't going to want or need your help, and you just have to figure out how to deal with that. Like, at some point in your life, one of your friends might start spending all, all her time with a guy you think is bad news. And you have to decide if you need to intervene as a friend, or just let it go because people can change or drift apart or whatever, because that's just something that happens. Dave, your wisdom, my god, is knocking my socks off. Holy shit, please tell me the secret to your wise ways. And while you're at it, maybe you could tell me what the fuck you're talking about. Look, all I'm saying is, there comes a time in every young woman's life when she has to come to terms with the definition, with the decision to gradually morph into a juggalo while all her friends and loved ones watch in dismay. Terezia has strolled through the dark carnival and taken a great brooding whiff of that de uh, decision's festive asshole, and the choice she has made is all too clear. She's down with the clown. No, don't say that! It's true, man. You can live in denial for, denial for only so long. But as your bro, I have to say it like it is. She and Gamzee Man, that is literally a thing. They are in a hate square together. Total kismet spades, dude. No, that's not what I mean. I mean, I know that. Just, why do you have to put everything so colorfully? I guess I do the same thing, but you always seem to take things to a different level of gross. Just please say shit normally for a change, okay? Regarding Gamzee, yeah, I knew about that already. Oh. Really? Then what the fuck have I been tiptoeing around all this time, god? Uh, what, tiptoeing around all, all this time? God damn. I thought it was supposed to be like, the this big secret that would destroy you if you found out. Motherfucker, please. Do you think I'm an idiot? I suspected this was going on for a long time. I was just being like you, playing it cool, letting her do whatever. Then why is it a problem now? Because this is the last straw! We're supposed to be ready for action by now, not comatose, half-naked, and fago sticky God, I wonder what sort of bullshit he's got her believing in now. About the mirthful messiahs, or Shangri-La, and all that garbage. It makes me so sad to think she's caught up in the, his superstitious web of lies. It's been awful watching this, the person I used to know slowly drift away from me, to the point where she might as well be gone. How did you manage to deal with that? What? You and she used to see each other all the time. What happened? Like I said, I just put it behind me. She started sneaking around events and stuff, acting suspicious, trying to hide the fact that she was seeing him. Like, she was obviously ashamed of it and worried how I'd react, but it was hella transparent that was, uh, that was going on, so I just said, that's fine, y'all can do your black round thing with a juggalo, it's your decision, <clears throat> but I can't keep playing along. I can't do the quadrant thing, it's just too weird for me. I'm not a troll and I'm not all open-minded about getting multicultural. I still don't understand the spades thing and it makes me really fucking uncomfortable even trying to imagine how that works, and I sure as fuck don't want to date anybody who's got a hate clown on the side. So I said no hard feelings, I still like you and all, do whatever makes you happy, I'll just be over here in the hypergravity gravity hypergravity chamber training the beat lord english we have a hypergravity chamber <laughs> no oh what about you have you been talking to gamzy this whole time or is he just balls out lying to you about sneaking around the meter with terezi i thought moirals were supposed to be open with each other about stuff like that yeah uh gamzy ended our moral legion some uh, quite some time ago oh shit sorry to hear about that it's fine it was a really a dead end pale relationship at first it really seemed like it was a i was a necessary part of his life keeping his shit under control but as time went on he just got completely disinterested and wasn't keeping up with uh, with his end of the thing at all. He started getting so unbelievably self-satisfied and pious, like, way more than he ever was before. Like, he's just so completely convinced he's found his calling, that this session is the gateway to the promised land where he'll fulfill his destiny. He's so caught up in his idiotic schemes he couldn't give a fuck about me anymore. Whatever. At least he stopped killing people. Amazing I spent three years on this rock and never said one thing to the guy. I saw him once, though. Just a glimpse in a dark hallway. It's kind of like seeing a blurry purple Bigfoot with a huge boner. Oh god, that fucking god tier outfit. 
What a goddamn faker. I can't for the life of me imagine where he got that thing. I know Kanaya sure as hell didn't make it for him. The man literally has no shame. Why is he wearing it? I don't know. I don't think he even knows. <clears throat> Maybe to make a good impression on his fake-ass religious idol after he thrusts his sacred codpiece through the gates of Shangri-La. <laughs> That's the best thing we ever do together. Slam this asshole's dumb religion. Yeah! Really, it's the most hilarious fucking horseshit I've ever heard. I mean, pretty much all religions are wrong, but there's wrong and then there's wrong. As in, zero chance you were ever proven right about even a single thing, dude. Ever, ever, ever. <laughs> it's so true! I wish I could see the look on his face when, we, when he finally realizes everything he believes is a lie. Be one sad clown that day. His bulge will probably deflate and make this high-pitched noise plus correspondent flatulence. Hey, Dave. What do you think will happen to us after we meet up with the others? I mean, as friends. What do you mean as friends? I mean, will we still get to be bros? Uh, Yeah. No offense, Doug, but that's a dumb and neurotic question. No, but see, we're going to meet all these other people, John among them, and John is your best friend, so you will ostensibly resume that friendship where you left off. And John and I had a few th testy conversations with each other one day, and in most of those, I made a fool of myself. And I guess we became friends that day, maybe? But the reality is, it was just one day, and he'd be well within a reasonable frame of mind not to give a crap in hindsight about the guy who trolled him once three years ago. And the same goes for Jade. I thought we had a decent report, but again, it was one day forever ago. She probably barely remembers me at this point. Whereas it doesn't matter for you, because you go way back with them. This is like a fucking heartfelt reunion for you guys. But where's it leave me? I can hardly call Gamzy a friend anymore. Who knows if my friendship with Terezi will ever be what it was before. I used to be pretty close with Kanaya, but now she and Rose never leave each other alone for more than a fucking minute. All my other friends are dead, and now we're leaving the dream bubbles behind. And then there's you, so... I'm just... wondering what happens next. You've got the mayor. You're pretty damn tight with the mayor, aren't you? The mayor's friendship is a universal constant, and I am insulted beyond comprehension as well as my capacity to vomit that you wouldn't see it otherwise. Yeah, the mayor's rules, but as usual, you're overcomplicating this. Just like you overcomplicate everything. Friendship leadership, friendship, leadership romance, uh, shipping grids, and dick battles. This is real simple. Our meter will somehow Tokyo drift to a dead stop in the new session, at which point we will keep being bros for life or something. I will start being friends with uh, John and Jade again, because they are my friends and never stop being that. John will also be your friend because he's cool and also do if it's who is easy who is easy to be friends with. Jade will be your friend too, because she's nice and likes being friends with people. I can personally guarantee that she will be happy to see you. And as for the new people, I don't know about them, but they'll probably be your friends too. All I know is two of them are, are my parents, and two of them are John's parents, and ain't no rule that says you can't be friends with your bros, mom, and pop. Especially when your bros, mom, and pop are a couple of sassy teens. As for Terezi, I don't know. I guess we'll see what happens. And as for Gamzy, fuck the guy with a balloon poodle. <clears throat> Friendship lesson secured the end. <laughs> Uh-oh. Look who's starting to come around. <clears throat> <coughs> How fake Gansy's religion. Yeah, it's true, actually. I didn't even think about Ayilde. <clears throat> Dave and Karka just have such a good, like, dynamic with each other. It's awesome. I love it so much. <clears throat> Wake up, sleepyhead! Hong Kong Kong! Yeah, that's right! It's time to face the fucking music! X6, intermission 5, intermission 1. Hey, you! Computer man! I need more help! No! Computer man! Assist me with, mo uh, with more hot tips! No! Yes, I'm having trouble understanding Blue Hat. This is a shameful exploitation of our arrangement. You weren't supposed to talk to, to talk anymore once you left Earth. I did not agree to those terms. Every time we talk, you complain that I'm being self-indulgent. But you always come back for more. It's like you can't get enough of me. I think you might be obsessed. Give me more hot tips, asshole. You only made that cow top so you could talk to me on the go, didn't you? No. Please don't lie. <laughs> Who else would you use to talk to in your solo session? Gamzee? I bet you haven't said one word to him through that device. You never even referred to him by his name. The clown has been an adequate peon when it comes to doing things I don't want to do. There's no reason to speak to him through my fun helmet. You should try to be better friends with him. He actually, he basically ditched his best buddy for you. Who cares? He reveres you and you treat him like shit. Yes. So? So? You're off to a pretty good start at being a god, I guess? Thank you. Look, I just said a polite thing. Now reward me with what I want. Ugh. Yellow Hat is very fast. As a maiden, he has been very useful. But I am having trouble determining the abilities of Blue Hat. Yellow Hat and Blue Hat? You should come up with better names for them than that. Like what? Like, I don't know. Maybe some cool mobster names? Mobster names? Why would I give them mobster names? Because mobsters are cool. They don't look like mobsters. They look like fucking leprechauns. Anyone can be a mobster, though. Even cherubs and leprechauns. Being a mobster isn't about what you look like. It's about what's inside you. Wow. That is so profound. Now stop stalling and give me tips. Are these really... <laughs> Are these the only two you've unlocked so far? Yes, I have conquered the second planet, and I've now traveled to the third. Before I conquer this one, I would like to know what Blue Hat does. He's pretty much doing what he does. He seems to be stuck. Is he broken? No, he's just slow. What? That's his power. Yellow Hat is fast, Blue Hat is slow. That's a horrible power. How is it even a power? It just is. Ugh, I was looking forward to achieving <laughs> more powerful minions, not more m uh, malingering fools to take up space in my dark carnival. Do they get better than this? That depends on what you mean by better. <laughs> Oh my god. Okay, we're done. Bye. <laughs> that depends on what you mean by better.
<laughs> End of Act 6, Intermission 5, Intermission 1. <coughs> Fucking hell. <clears throat> Wake up, sleepyhead. Wait, why didn't even say that? Stay asleep all day. Uh, sleep, stay asleep all you want. Like, I give a fuck. But you're kind of missing some important shit here. We spent three faux relativ relativistic years cruising through the metaphysical ass crack of nowhere. And when we finally get here, you're all tuckered out. Like y'all didn't sleep enough on this boat already. Some of the sick, nastiest shit I anyone ever got. <clears throat> I owe to this. Uh, anyone ever got, I owe to this friggin' boat. Dude, this is a big deal. Everyone's waiting for us out there. I mean, probably. I don't know where we are in some green hilly place with all these stone hinges sprinkled around. Did you know there could be uh, a plurality of stone hinges? I didn't, I didn't, but guess fucking what? Hinges a pe uh, hinges a plenty where this place is concerned. Hey, where's Jade? <laughs> fucking John. Mm. Fucking. <clears throat> I guess she left already? Maybe there's an emergency somewhere in her doggy senses letter there? Maybe someone fell down a well. What do you think, John? Do you think our teen parents fell down a well? <clears throat> nah, I sincerely doubt that any of them would be that pathetic. Hmm. Whatever it was, it must have been important enough for Jade to ditch like this. <clears throat> Either that or... Maybe she was that desperate to finally get away from me. Between you and me, John, I didn't really handle things with her as well as I could have. <clears throat> oh, oh well. Maybe Real Devil treat her better. Or not, I don't know. I did her favorite cut and, uh, cut and bird date out of her life. <clears throat> Nobody really deserves Bird Dave as a boyfriend or a friend or anything. It's like getting one of the janky days in the bargain bin at the Dave Depot. Or one of the markdown days the day after National Dave Day. It's like somebody taxidermied, taxidermized your Dave and expected you not to notice. Feathers, what feathers? Huh, no, that Dave is totally normal and okay. You should go back to being bros with the Real Dave when you see him. I'll be fine. I'll just flap around and do my thing alone. I'm completely alright with that at this point. We had our ups and downs, John, but all in all, it was cool to go down this road, go on this road trip with you. <clears throat> there were some times, man. The times. I'm telling you, they were unreal. I bet you people would pay good money to see every second of that madcap stunts we were going to going down on this ship basically 24-7. If all's good talk now. Nah, just joking, this was seriously boring as hell. But I mean, it was still cool though, so yeah. Hey, what's the ring anyway? I've seen you with that ring before and I guess I just, just like, okay, John's got a magic ring for some reason. No need to mention that or anything. But where did you even get it? You can't even hear me. Uh, you can't even hear me. You got your snooze on so hard. Ain't gonna wake you up <clears throat> to hassle you about no ring. Probably should have said all this stuff when you were awake anyway. I like the stuff about friendship. Fuck it. I'll just leave another one of my patented magic notes taped to your shoe or your cowl or something. My magic notes rule. I'll uh, I'll misleave them taped on, taped on stuff. Oh, I should talk to myself a lot, don't I? Wow. Why haven't I made this observation? I probably needed to be a bird for exactly three years to finally f have that epiphany. I wonder if real Dave ever had that epiphany. Probably not because he's not a bird. Bottom line is being the guy who's also a bird makes you think. Anyway, I'm out. <laughs> oh, look at all the... I don't know if you can see it on the screen. All the Daves. P.S. Happy birthday, John. Have some water marks for the road. <laughs> Act 6, intermission 5, intermission 2. <clears throat> I unlocked more gnomes. I thought they were leprechauns. I don't care what they are. Okay. I have now conquered four planets, and I have the same amount of gnomes under my command. Yellow hat, blue hat, red hat, and now purple hat. Congratulations. The planets are becoming increasingly difficult to conquer. I almost did not manage to destroy the purple planet within the allotted time. Unfortunately, the quality of the unlocked gnomes has not increased the mass to escalate the difficulty of my quest. It's going to be just the opposite. These gnomes are shit. What's wrong with the gnomes? Okay, red hat, he has no fucking powers at all. Unless his power is to follow me around constantly. Yes, that's basically what he does. Purple hat is even worse. Is his power to dance around all the time while singing riddles to me? Yes. Awful. Purple Hat's behavior is so infuriating. I've attempted to murder him several times, but to no avail. You can't kill Purple Hat. He's too lucky. That's also his power. Being really lucky. What good does that do me? I don't know. Get him to solve puzzles for you? Use him as a human shield sometimes. I mean, a gnome shield. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's actually a really good idea. You shouldn't be whining about how lame your minions are. As you accumulate more, your job is obviously to combine their talents in creative ways to overcome the increasingly difficult challenges on your quest. Synergize your time gnomes. Make them more, th uh, more than the sum of their pointy hats. That's going to be difficult. They're all idiots. Nobody said it would be easy. Fine. I have no more questions for now. Hey, did you kill the cute turtle? No. <clears throat> but I can see your past trail. You're standing there holding a gun and pointing at the turtle. Okay, then yes. I killed the turtle. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> Fucking hell. Your red hat just follow you around. <coughs> Brady, I can't imagine. I can't imagine how confused you must be at this point. I'm almost 6,000 pages in the Homestuck. <laughs> Not the turtle. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Do they literally have a pirate ship? Hey, look, there's a John arm. It is what it is. Dude, 
You've got, what, this is, this is part 30? So there's like 60 hours of me reading this so far. Actually more, because there's going to be, or it's 60 right now. It'll be 61 by the end of the stream. Hey, it's the blue boy again. <clears throat> See him there? He's just off, off the starboard shit. Yo, watch how far I can fork him from. <laughs> Mina, put the trident down. Don't make me con kung fish, fish skate it again. Kung fish skate. <laughs> oh, it's so fucking cool. Hey, it's John. Friska, is that you? Yeah, get over here. All right. Oh, great. <laughs> <coughs> nice to see you again, John. It's been too long. Yeah, actually, has it, hasn't it been exactly a year? I think it was my birthday last time we met, too. <laughs> a year for you, maybe. Who even knows how long it's been out here, but who cares? The point is, as long as you can see the plan I described to you before is in full swing. You mean the big treasure hunt with all these black maps? With all those black maps? <clears throat> Yes, but they aren't black anymore. Not totally. Everything's gone exactly as I intended. English has taken the bait. Hook, line, and sinker. He's been chasing our extended party around the ring, blowing shit up with his monster breath, thus revealing the path of the treasure in the process. I must say, for an evil mastermind, the guy is kind of a dope. <clears throat> Supposedly his every move is a carefully calculated ploy to assure his existence in the first place. Yet, here he is, wrecking the joint like an oaf, unwittingly helping the hero find the weapon that will finally take him down. And we're almost there, too. Although, by now, it's becoming embarrassingly obvious that the treasure was hidden right... Uh, around where we started all along. These nests have just been leading us well, all in a big, stupid circle. I should have seen it coming. I guess that's my bad. <clears throat> in terms of bonehead moves, but uh, that's English. In, in terms of bonehead moves, that's English. English one, Friska one. So I guess we're even. But maybe we don't have to mention that uh, that detail when we document my hero heroism in the annals of greatness. Uh, mention what exactly? Exactly. <laughs> I almost forgot how, how deceptively quick you are on the uptake, John. That's not so impressive. I was confused by what you were saying, too. Tavros, if you're going to interrupt, don't mumble. I, uh, and even then, don't. Anyway, I really don't have, uh, don't mind the fact that these cryptic treasure maps have led us all on a wild hunkbird chase. I've never once complained about a good long treasure hunt, and I'm not about to start now. Besides, with the way this, uh, that space-time uh, works out here, who can say for sure uh, we would be able to find the treasure at all unless we trace this exact path? Nobody can say that, is who. Least of all English, who, as far as I know, can't actually speak so much as issue blood-curdling roars that cleave the foundations of reality itself. You're, of course, welcome to join us on our adventures, uh, so, uh, for as long as you're asleep. We can use another hand on deck. I'll even give you a rank and title. You get to be lower than me. That's the fairest rule. Wrong. Tavros, who's the captain here? Last time I checked, it was, it wasn't Swabby Nitrum, Poop Master Extraordinaire. <clears throat> <clears throat> Separating from Dave. Okay. Tavis being jealous of John. Yeah. That's, that's really funny. He fucking hates being around here. <laughs> uh, Tavis gets jealous, in my opinion, also. By the way, hi, Tavis. How have you been? Okay. Cool pirate outfit you have there. No, thanks. But it's not cool. It's dumb. Frisco wants me to wear it, though. So I do. And she'll, uh, so she'll be happy. Don't ask me where my pants are. I wasn't going to. We all look amazing as pirates. That's non-negotiable. No argument here. <clears throat> what about the rest of your crew? I remember her, the punk, uh, the punky one who's always, uh, who always likes to stab me with her spear. But I really hope she doesn't do that to me this time. Dream on, blue nerd. You and my crosshair, sucker. Got you, uh, got you right where I want. Just biding my time, biding and biding. Gonna hunt you till we both double dead. You are my obsession, little bluefish. My shrimpiest of whales. My mobiest of dicks. Call me Fishmyo. Stop it. But I don't know uh, the one who looks kind of like your sister. What is your name? Aranea. Hi, and what about those two over there? One piece of sick edition. Oh boy, you're right. I remember in this panel when it came out just how fucking stupid this idea is of having the two eye patches. <laughs> These are my friends, Aradia and Solix. I have recruited them for the, this exposition as, as specialists. They aren't really here to do any fighting, but their abilities will become useful once we retrieve the treasure. Hello. Hey, are you alive? Your eyes do not look sp uh, spooky and ghostly. Thanks. Yes, I'm alive. Yeah, and apparently she intends to stay that way. Hence her, unpr her principled, if somewhat lame, commitment of pacifism. But considering our history together, I'm willing to let bygones be bygones. I'm happy to have her on my crew in whatever capacity she likes. Your history? What happened? Wait, that's a rude question. Sorry. Friska killed her too. She used the other guy there, tragically, as the death weapon. Hey! What did I say about bygones be by being bygones? That's like rule fucking one of this ship. Anyway, she becomes a ro became a robot and killed me back, so obviously we're cool now. Jeez. Why does everyone di always die so much? <clears throat> I don't like this guy's one to talk. Sox, don't make our guys uncomfortable. He's already uncomfortable, and he should be. We all should be. Really, I haven't thought uh, about any of that in a long time. Ancient conflicts don't mean anything to me anymore, but I was more than thrilled by the opportunity to go on another adventure like this. We used to enjoy such 
uh, campaigns all uh, together all the time when we were younger. Of course, now the teams are a little different. <laughs> yeah, man, those are the days. What about you? Why do you have double eye patches? Uh, because I'm blind, stupid. I can't tell if you're alive or not, too. Or, or too, or uh, alive, too, or not, because I can't see if your eyes are spooky. They're spooky as shit, but yes, I'm alive. Okay, here's the short version. I used to be able to see, but then I went blind. Then I used my powers too hard and died, but it turned out I was only half dead. Half dead? Let me finish. So the ghost half of me could see again, so I was only half blind. But then somebody prototyped my corpse, which I guess sucked the ghost half out of me, uh, of me out of my body, to make me fully alive again, also fully blind. And now the ghost part of my soul is sharing a sprite body with fucking Aridin, of all people. Who's Aridin? Just the douche who blinded me in the first place, so it doesn't even matter. Um, alright. But I don't think I quite followed all of that. What does being half dead mean? You know... Forget it. I'm so sick of telling this story to people over and over and over and nobody understanding what the hell I'm talking about. It's also simple. No, actually it isn't. It's the fucking stupid story that makes no sense. That's that's the problem. My marginal existence is fraught with so much pointless duality and complicated nonsense, so I'm done even trying to explain it. From now on, I should just wear a shirt that says, don't ask me about my disability or my mortality, then everything would be fine. It's really kind of a shame Gamesy prototype aired his torso parts and swiped uh, his ghost from the afterlife. I bet he would have had... <clears throat> uh, he would have had a great time on this voyage. I used to own him during our nautical campaigns all the time. If he was on our on this ship, I'd walk the plank and plummet through the fake ass water through infinite nowhere forever. Besides, you act like you haven't uh, already recruited at least fifty fucking Aridans from Doom timelines in your army. You really are shamefully prejudiced against our alternate reality ghost selves. We're just as real as we are and have the same emotions and everything. Give me a break, Solix. As if you don't view them uh, the exact same way. <laughs> You've got real Aaron, and then pretty much a whole bunch of pretenders out there. They're all real! Shit, I don't even like Aaron, but here I am sticking up for his copies. See, you just called them copies. Even you can't avoid accidentally using a problematic slur, which reveals that no matter what you believe about your morals, deep down you're always going to favor the original, while feeling all the others as duplicates of lesser value. Okay, whatever. Just whatever. Rationalize the collateral damage to your army all you want. And to think... Uh, and to think, before I joined your army, I heard rumors that you might have changed. Like I learned, like learned to be a better person or something. Haha, <laughs> yeah, right! Oh, please. I hardly think I'm a bad person for failing to give a shit about a billion meaningless dead nepotists, do you? No, you're not a bad person for that particular reason, I guess. What am I seriously supposed to do? Fly around and befriend each one individually? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I have better things to do with my time. Let's try to be at least somewhat practical here. I've met most of those nepotists. They're all very nice. Oh, shut up. I fucking love that Tavros uh, autocorrected to tacos. That's just, last time John and tacos were, hang tacos were hanging out with Vriska. That's so fucking funny to me. <laughs> you should just do it. <laughs> oh, man. Hang on, let me have some more salsa. It's been a minute since I had some salsa. That shit always seems to compound, too. You make one grammatical or spelling error, and then it just fucking cascades from there. Ah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what about all the ships ahead? Are they part of the treasure hunt, too? Of course, that's my army. <coughs> okay, I mean our army, but like, on boats. Isn't army on boats usually called a navy? John, help me out. I seem to be having trouble remembering which one of us is the captain. Was it the dorky blue pajamas, or was it the veteran sailor in the red captain's coat? That's right, the captain was me. And I say it's an army that happens to be on a bunch of boats. Oh, oh, damn. He got smoked. Wow, so smoked. Mina, did you catch those sick fires? No, but for real, it's pretty much, it pretty much is a navy. Just saying. Who's in the army? Thousands of ghosts, primarily those of old friends and acquaintances. Oh it's, oh, it's unsettling. We've amassed a coalition of eager volunteers ready to lay down their ghost lives for a worthy cause. You mean fight Lord Eng fighting Lord English? <clears throat> Lord English? When we're ready for that, yes, but we need a, uh, the treasure first. So for now, they're sailing well ahead of us in large numbers to attract his attention, so we can do more damage to the ring and fill out the rest of our maps. We should be very grateful for their, for their bravery. They are making a noble sacrifice for us all. Prefer, yeah, right. I'm mostly sure she's mind controlling them. God damn it, Tavros! We really don't need your play-by-play -play commentary on everything. Wait, you're not mind-controlling all those ghosts? Or you're mind, you're mind controlling all those ghosts? No. Well, not all of them. Once you're enough together, others tend to latch onto the mob out of curiosity. We trolls have a way of clustering together naturally. You got to understand, John, most of these people are pretty self-absorbed. They just needed a little bit of persuasion to join the cause. Word. Yeah, but isn't this still kind of, um, dickish? 
But all these stubborn jackasses are going to double die anyway if we don't all work together and kill this guy. This is war, John. In times of war, difficult decisions have to be made uh, with the lives of the many. Just think of me as a general giving orders to my troops. It just happens that the orders are a little more direct in this case. Hey, Sir Cat Deuce. Let's not lose track of uh, uh, who's actually in charge of this shit, okay? Yeah, yeah, all her, her imperious team condescension. The fresh new face of tyranny, Supreme Admiral Pisces. At this time, I would like to motion for a 15-minute uh, bowing break so that we may demonstrate our reverence for this bold, spunky leader. Yes. Tavro, stop bowing. That was a joke. No, keep doing that. Lower, Swabby. Lower. Face on the fucking deck. Yes, just like that. Just like that. Perfect. Okay. How do you mind control so many ghosts at once? Isn't that kind of hard? Well, I do have a little help. John, did I mention my ancestor? She is the best. She is? <clears throat> I must. Uh, 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 fucking, that's a, that's RNA. They're the same fucking color. <clears throat> uh, I must admit, I was not in favor of the idea at first, but Frisky made a very strong case for using our combined powers in this way. In the perfect reality, no one would have to get hurt, but the stakes are too high to be shying away from such measures. See what I mean? The best. Uh. It has been wonderful spending so much time on this adventure with my descendant. Not just because it's helped uh, me get to know her better, but because it's opened my eyes to things about myself I was never really in touch with. There are certain capabilities within me I have never quite been able to face, and she's helped me realize that I've been hiding from them all my life, and well beyond. It must be true of uh, what they used to say on my world, that if you really want to know who you are, look to the legacy left behind by your, uh, left behind by your ancestor. I think that wisdom works in both directions. Well put, Marquis. I've always felt the exact same way. Puke! Okay, oh, oh my glove, the Cirque Twins being adorable again. <clears throat> Nitrum, get your mop ready for swabbing up this vomit coming out of my mouth. Uh, uh, <laughs> out my mouth. You know. Can you just stick a fork in the sentimental carp? Maybe pretend you ain't hit it, uh, hit it off so good. You ever stop and think how this makes me feel? There's no reason to be jealous, Mina. You know nothing uh, has changed about our friendship. Jealous? Bitch, no. Just makes me uh, think about my kid descendant, and how instead of having this cool, frenzy relation with her, I just got this uncontrollable urge to stab her to death so she doesn't threaten my supremacy. Which is a shame, because she's so cute. Aww. God damn, my royal blood in the crate junket makes me have to do. Oh well. Maybe someday I'll find an heiress who's, uh, who my genes don't instantly make me want to murder on sight. And then I can teach her the badass way of being a boss, uh, being boss and shit. God, trolls are so weird. <laughs> Which is a shame because she's so cute. Aww. <coughs> John just said trolls are weird. He said it quietly, but I heard him. Hey, you snitch. Yeah, but aren't we? Uh, moral of the story is Blue Kid is a, is a dumb nerd, but is uh, right when he says stuff. Look at that. It's like me and him are becoming fast fronds, us lulling him to a sense of false confidence already. What? Soon, my little whale. Soon. Uh, it is true, to be human, the ways of uh, trolls from both Alternia and Bephorus will seem uh, very strange. In fact, prior to uh, uniting in the afterlife, even the two groups of trolls were reasonably alien to one another. I've had a great deal of time to study the cultures of many species throughout Paradox Space. No matter which race you belong to, one can always find another whose ideals pose a challenge in uh, of comprehension to even the most open-minded. And uh, though the ethical standards of those from Alternia may seem unpalatable to you, rest assured there are beings elsewhere in the cosmos whose violent behavior would be considered extreme even to most trolls. Here she goes. Actually, John, I'm very glad you brought this up, because I was in the middle of a wonderful story about that this very subject, which you interrupted when you boarded our ship. Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. Really, I'm quite pleased that you did. This way I can start over from the beginning. <laughs> there were uh, some rough patches in my original telling, which I can go back and fix. This time it'll be much better. Okay, what's the story about? It is a tale about a very mysterious alien race called Cherubs. Let us begin. Once upon a time... <laughs> World building! <laughs> there was a very mysterious alien race called Cherubs. RNA, I thought you said you'd fix the shitty parts of the story. You started with that crappy line the first time, too. The opening line is fine. It's alright, I guess. Not. Oh, shut up and let me tell my story. Now, where was I? There was a very mysterious alien race called Cherubs. Right, there was a very mysterious alien race called Cherubs. But there is one Cherub in particular who, for at least the first half of our story, will be our heroine. <clears throat> okay, so I did make it to this part, because I remember this. I'm like, I'm like trying to see where I dropped off. He can have, he can have a little of snitchiness as a treat. <laughs> <coughs> <clears throat> he spent, uh, she spent eons roaming her galaxy, completely alone, but the time uh, had come for her to find a, a mate. She, uh, this is no small task for a cherub, being an a social species, they spend virtually no time in each other's presence at all. Aside from when it was time to mate, they may go their entire lives out encountering, a, encountering another. And so they scatter their numbers throughout space, each staking a territory spanning many light years. 
But like a predator is able to track the scent of its prey, a cherub can sense the presence of another nearby. This sense is especially strong if that cherub shares the same qualities its other half once had long ago, before it experienced the ma uh, maturation process known as predomination. Oh, get to read this fucking novel. <clears throat> You see, when a young cherub hatches, it would appear that only one creature has begun its life, but the appearance is not to be trusted. The young cherub actually consists of two completely distinct beings, a male and a female, each sharing one body. The two halves are endowed with polar opposite predispositions as well. One predisposed toward ma malevolence, another toward benevolence, good or evil, if you prefer to deal in simplistic terms, or at least those which are convenient for the sake of the story. I prefer to view the dichotomy as a kind of moral alignment, like an attribute that dictates the choices a character makes in certain types of games I used to, uh, I used to play. The male and female halves can be aligned either way, as long as they differ from each other. The resulting conflict between the two personalities is central to life as a cherub, both before and after predomination. Shortly after hatching, the two halves begin vacillating, taking turns controlling the body. The only physical differentiation between the two is the coloration of their cheek swirls. This indicates alignment. There is otherwise no way to tell male and female apart before a cherub predominates. The vacillation process is de uh, demarcated <coughs> by sleep. When the male goes to sleep, the female wakes up, and when the male wakes up, again, the female sleeps. And so it goes, back and forth like this, as the two identities vie for dominance over the other, and ultimately permanent control over the body. They grow to detest one another, and develop a view of social interaction centered entirely around animosity and confrontation. For good cherubs, this readies them for a, life, a long life of isolation, as they will prefer to avoid the sort of conflict that comes with social interaction, as they have been, been conditioned to understand, understand it. But for evil ones, the contentious upbringing only serves to fuel their inclination to harm others. And though this duality makes for a torment of childhood, the inner conflict it creates is an extremely important part of a young cherub's life. The defining part, actually. It is a struggle a cherub must overcome to mature, and this process culminates in predomination. One half will prove to have a stronger will than the other. The less dominant half will, be, will then weaken over time, and it will eventually become clear to both that one will not survive. The dominant personality will then completely consume the other, integrating it in such a way that only one is left. The cheeks will become solidly colored, and the cherub will grow ma to maturity as a single being, endowed with the alignment of the dominant half, uh, and with all his or her personal qualities at the forefront of the union. In the case of our heroine, heroine she was the good half, and the day of her pre predomination was, in a sense, the day her brother died, and though it was to her benefit and personal growth because of this of this loss she would always live with the sense that something was missing every sexually mature cherub lives with this feeling it drives them to seek out another cherub similar to the half they lost the part of their of their being which they grew up in perpetual conflict with the desire to travel the universe in hopes of reigniting that conflict is very important to their species it's the force which compels them to procreate <sighs> fucking hell so she set out to track the, his scent, as it were, and soon she found a physical trail as well, a path of carnage left behind by a particularly destructive male cherub. She followed the debris from civilized worlds and star systems he left behind, as if to mock her, to make it clear he knew of her pursuit was all, uh, and was all but paving her way with the dead. His brutality made her more furious, thus setting the mood, so to speak, for their imminent courtship. Oh, I remember the fa- I remember these trolls. They won the, uh, the contest to have their fan trolls be featured in here. A cherub, his alignment, is seemingly motivated by a little other than to conquer and destroy. From a bio-existential perspective, they behave somewhat like viruses attacking the system from within. But as with all symbiotic organisms living within a universe, they are balancing factors. While those in inhabiting an evil cherub's territory will regard it as an unpredictable tyrant, those in the territory of a good cherub will likely come to view it as a protector, waiting quietly for millennia in deep space, ready to attack any encroaching threat. In that sense, they are not unlike cells in a universal immune system. Yeah, I remember them. Because they die immediately. <laughs> <laughs> this balance of forces allows stability, such that life and new civilizations can blossom and thrive within a universe, thus assuring the possibility of its own elaborate procreation process. But if that balance was ever disturbed, it would lead to, uh, to chaos in the biosystem. The universe could not survive for long, and if by some means a cherub with such destructive t tendencies were to achieve unprecedented power, the resulting imbalance would be catastrophic for paradox space itself, and though the heron of our story uh, would have no way of knowing, this is exactly what would result from the pursuit of Rikismesis. $11,000 well spent. Yep. <coughs> Rich kid and richer kid. Oh, boy. Ain't that the truth? We did have, um, we had an Olive Blood fan troll, my, uh, my wife and I did, where they were basically just a gardener tending to a giant forest for their giant sloth, uh, Lucis. And that was their whole thing, is that they, they tended and nurtured a giant forest so their Lucis could have a place to stay. I like that fan troll. Never really went anywhere that well with that character. 
<clears throat> like humans, cherubs perceive romance through only one quadrant. Unlike humans, their relationships are exclusively black, but their mating ritual is much more violent than any practice trolls uh, would or even physically could engage in. And though it is critical to the per perpetuation of their race, the confrontations can sometimes be lethal to one or both cherubs. Regardless of the outcome, the stakes are always high. The winner of the duel will assume control of the other's territory, while the loser will slink away to bear the offspring. So as she toured the planetary records, she knew her quest for a mate was not just about the propagation of her species, but the liberation of billions of from a monster. She pursued him for many sweeps with mounting obsession, until one day the trail came to an end at a black hole. Cherubs typically seek out black holes as the setting for their mating ritual, but not any black hole. Once uh, long ago, it was a star, and circling that star was a planet. That planet was home to one of the present, presently sparring cherubs. The male in this case returned to the, spite, or to the site of his hatching to mate, a location now conspicuously occupied by a truly massive black hole. This is where she found him, and this is where they would duel. <coughs> Except it got kind of ruined because uh, isn't Zephros's Lucis a giant sloth type thing? So it's like I couldn't even like we. I, I don't think I could even go and flesh out that character again because then it would just be like, oh, you're just copying Zephros. But uh, we came up with this with this character. Fuck. Ah, uh, damn. It would have been. I think we were. I think it would have been my sophomore year of college. So that would have been like 2012, 2013. That was a long time ago. <clears throat> but yeah, like the idea was like the, like the prehistoric sloths. The sloths were like 10 feet tall or something like that. Like that was their, their looses. But now it's like I'm afraid to go back and be like, oh, you're just copying Zephros. Like, no, actually, I had this idea years before Hive Swap came out. <laughs> <clears throat> well, my wife and I had this idea. It's not even all me. Wait, she helped. We, we made a bunch of trolls together. Because at one point, we wanted to make our own MSP, uh, our own fan adventure. Anyway. <laughs> While an adult cherub is a fearsome creature and would be a formidable opponent to anyone in, in its unaltered uh, state, this is not the form in which they do battle with each other. The ritual is more extreme and physically demanding than any other kind of courtship or duel in the universe. The moment they meet, they will both undergo a dramatic metamorphosis. <clears throat> The mates will then duel as two vast frightening serpents, each an, astro each an astronomical unit in length. Fucking. This is the weirdest fucking story to, like, world building here. <clears throat> the tangled struggle between the green... The green... AUs? Oz? is exceedingly brutal and can last for sweeps. While dueling uh, in such a monstrous form, their energy is inexhaustible. The transformation taps into the cherub's latent connection with an enigmatic force of presiding over all that is eternal and pre uh, permeating all those endowed with immortality. Normally, this power is only accessible to them during mating. In this form, they are only able to be injured by one another and are otherwise indestructible. Hence, the ritual can never be stopped by an outside force until it is complete. It should come as no surprise that in this story our heroine is victorious. Upon defeating her mate, she initiated the interlocking formation to complete the coupling, while assuming the dominant position, a stance undetectable to all but the most astute observers of the zoologically dubious. Consequently, the male is fertilized with the young. Ugh. <laughs> There's just a lot going on. He then slithered away in disgrace from the territory he'd just lost. A cherub looking to nest will search for a dead planet situated near a massive dying star. The egg is deposited on the planet's surface, and the rising temperature from the expanding red giant will incubate the egg until it is ready to hatch. Later in life, the cherub will grow wings, assuming it has matured properly, and if it has learned to fly well enough to reach the safe distance from the nest before the star goes supernova, uh, soon the hungry cherub will return and feast on the resulting stellar energy. Doing so allows it to gain enough strength to travel great distances and claim its own territory. The star will then collapse into a black hole, serving as a distinct gravitational beacon to the cherub later in life, so it may return there to mate. <clears throat> it just reeks of symbolism, doesn't it really? Does it have to be a sloth? I don't know. I like the giant sloth idea because it's like a big... Just a big fucking hulking creature. I could probably still work with them. I don't know. <clears throat> I have a lot of other shit on my plate right now. As it happens, our heroine's mate discovered Earth, long after it had journeyed to a new sun, and long since new civilizations had risen and fallen. Now on the brink of destruction from its dying star, its barren accommodations were ideal for a young cherub. There he deposited his single egg and flew away, never to return. No cherub ever spawns more than one offspring at a time, for it is every cherub's destiny to grow up alone, or alone on the outside at least. From that egg hatched one very special cherub with two names, one that will, that few will ever know, and one that few should ever say. A fascinating 
uh, thing about chair reproduction is how the parent's alignment is passed on to the young. If the male lays the egg, the alignments of the child's two halves will be the same as the parents. If the female lays the egg, the alignments will be flipped, and the young male and female halves will be endowed with opposite alignments from, of the parents. As such, the male half took after his father. Perhaps the son even exceeded him in violent tendencies. It is hard to imagine there was ever been a chair more willf willfully destructive or as stubbornly de dedicated to conquest than the monstrosity he would grow up to become. Due to his indomitable nature, I believe victory over his... Fucking Gansey up there. <clears throat> victory over his sister was a foregone conclusion. Barring a highly improbable glitch in causality, it would be almost impossible for her to predominate over someone like him. And even so, he didn't have the patience to wait. Unfortunately for everyone to ever exist, he discovered a way to predominate early. Yet, it was not this act alone that would prove ominous, so much as the means through which he, it was achieved. He was allowed to become the solo player of a game which his kind was never meant to play. And so, it is with the predomination of her son that our heroine story ends and the story of our villain begins. <coughs> hey, Mina, where are you going? I'm taking a gaper break. God. But the story isn't over yet. I would keep the spoilers to a minimum, Graven. If you please. <laughs> Fef, Nepeta. <clears throat> Girl, your stories never end. My bladder can't even deal. Just keep talking while I'm gone. No, that's okay. We can wait. Epilogue spoilers? Ah, let's leave it. I, don't, I want to try and avoid spoilers, even though I know the epilogues are... Bleh. I already heard the damn story, though. Not all of it. Clubber, fuck. Can't you just keep yapping about snake sex while I hit the little g grubs room already? <laughs> they start dressing up. I'm afraid not. Everyone must listen to the full story. Oh, my fucking God. Are you really... You really are turning evil, aren't you? I'll be proud, except of how terrible and boring the actual consequences are for, are for me personally. Wait, does that mean when you're a ghost, you still have to pee? None of your business, blue kid. That's so weird. Am I the only one who thinks that's weird? No, John, it's definitely pretty weird that ghosts have to pee. You get used to life as a ghost pretty fast, though. But weren't you already pretty used to pee peeing when you were alive? Yeah, that's why you use it pretty fast, dummy. This is kind of a stupid conversation. Can we hear more about the snakes and whatnot? It was a pretty cool story. Yes, as soon as Mina returns from her visit to the load gaper. Holy mackerel, can you shit fucks just enjoy your space lizard porn while I take a fucking piss? <laughs> <laughs> I think we could all stand and, uh, stand and take a brief intermission from the story regardless uh, to let all the intriguing facts about Cherub sink in. Ugh, you and your intermissions. What is it with uh, your intermissions? They ain't even intermissions most of the time. They just an excuse to tell another dumb story and a longer dumb story. Yes, Mina, you are correct, and your reservations are noted. However, would it change your mind if uh, I were to propose not intermission or an interfission? Fine, let's do an interfishing thing, you said. Because of fish. BRB, scrubs. Okay. Alright, begin interfishing! <laughs> Fucking Solix. <laughs> <coughs> Alright, let's just hang out for a second here. <laughs> Boy. I use elevator stuck for this, huh? <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, gives me a break also. <laughs> I've had this guy fill the fuck down. Like captor, like captor, I guess. <laughs> so, uh... What are we doing here? I see. Okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> what is Arady doing? Arady's, uh, Arady does the, um, she pulled the, uh, fucking, I don't know what the name of that instrument is. It's barely an instrument. That bring. We'll do it again. No, it didn't. That sound effect. All right, end of interfishing. <laughs> She's vibing. <coughs> well, Frisk is on the xylophone, but the fucking the hangy chimes—that's what they are. She's on the chimes. Anyway, where was I? The heron story ends with the villain. Uh, ends and the villain story begins. I think. 
yes, that's right, is with the predomination of her son that our heroine story ends and the story of our villain begins. But, as we all know, beginnings are not always so easy to pinpoint in paradox space. One could say his story began the day he claimed immortality, or the moment his being was inexplicably confined to a juju, allowing him access to any realm uh, in which his vessel could capriciously materialize. But, for the sake of linearity, we may as well say his story began the day he and his, his sister hatched. <clears throat> oh, they're awful. Oh, that's, that's horrible. <clears throat> when a cherub hatches, the two undeveloped... Uh, personalities mingled together in the same body. There's not yet a clear division between the two. It will then consume the eggshell for the vital nutrients it contains. The sugary snack is irresistible to the starring Wiggler. Once it finishes its first meal, the two personalities will be pulled apart for good, and the child will pupate. The two has then begin vacillating when, with their sleep cycles, as I described. I hate the rest of Gamzy. Gamzy sucks. <laughs> he was fine at first, but like that, he's, he's one of the only two villains. Well, troll villains, I guess. As you might expect, the female child was so cheerful and friendly as could be. It was as cheerful and friendly as could be. Oh, A little happy, Callie. She took after her mother in every way. At least, the way her mother used to be. Long before she was hardened by centuries of isolation and obsessive pursuit of justice. And to just... And to just as little surprise, the male child was an insufferable brat. <coughs> it is just as well the chair... Uh, the chair parents abandoned their offspring. Raising such a child by the familiar standards of any race would be a monumental challenge. Nevertheless, it would seem there would be those who tried. Details in my research suggest our villain had a number of acolytes operating in the shadows, preparing for his arrival. He, uh, we will probably never know who these scurrilous <coughs> conspirators were, but it is uh, evident that at some point the cherub was locked in a room, either out of exasperation or for its own good, until it was old enough to enter the session. The children were left with everything a young cherub could ever want. Meat, candy, computers, a lifetime supply of special stardust, and of course their precious jujus. The Acolytes had clearly gone to great lengths to harvest such items from all over the cosmos so they would, could lavish their young master with gifts. They may have been prisoners, yes, but if you ask me, these children were very spoiled. While the female was preparing for a collaborative approach to the game, the male was plotting furiously against her. He never had any intention of working with her. As far as he was concerned, the game was his and his alone to conquer. <clears throat> One day, he put his plan into motion. He had his sister's, his sister's dream self assassinated on Prospin. The next time she went to sleep, she would never wake up again. When her brother woke up, he became the sole occupant of the body. He then freed himself from his chains and launched the session by himself. But his game was never meant to be played solo. Its format is inherently cooperative. The diversity of players, the combination of their efforts and aspects, this is what awakens the true creative potential of the game. Without them, a session will wither and die. If one enters alone, it completely alters the nature of the game. It changes its purpose. For a solo player, a challenging quest becomes an insurmountable insurmount one. A reward of infinite promise becomes a boon far more sinister. The gauntlet which the player must overcome is seemingly designed to be impossible. For all intents and purposes, it is not actually a game at all. It is a death sentence for any player foolish enough to accept the challenge. But it bears repeating. He was a very special cherub. He entered what is called a dead session. This qualifies as both a null and void session, but is even less than either of those. Compared to a typical session, it is almost unrecognizable. Before the game begins, Sky is blotted out with a dark layer of clouds. Its light is extinguished for good. There is no planet waiting for the player in the medium, so instead, he brought it with him. <clears throat> but when he arrived, there was no heroic journey for him to embark on. There was nothing. No sprite, no consorts, no underlings. The land had no name. Those things all needed to be unlocked. To unlock his true quest, he was forced to undergo a series of, of excruciatingly tedious trials. Only then would the way to the planet's core be revealed. There, he would consult with the, with the most monstrous denizens of all. And while such trials might discourage most players from even trying, our villain's response was quite the, the contrary. He was only emboldened by the mind-numbing chores. He took, them, he took to them with gusto, as if performing them out of spite. With perseverance, he found the final door and unlocked it. Waiting for him on the other side was a terrible creature named Yal Yaldabaoth. His denizen would allow him a brief audience, one just long enough for him to make the choice. There we go. Oh, there he is. You can see him. There he is. Ugh. <coughs> a worm? <laughs> Big snake. <laughs> no denizen has ever been mistaken for pleasant company, but the self-proclaimed god of all monsters is notoriously inhospitable to his players. 
His choices are known for their wild extremes, and to this player, in this session, he offered his most extreme choice of all. It was a choice between a path of conquest and a path of sacrifice. But this is putting it lightly. In a tongue only his player can understand, he described what the path of the martyr entailed. In short, it involved nothing. The player chooses to walk away from the temptation of power, to surrender all ambition, and to welcome death. In exchange for this pledge comes a promise. The player's sacrifice is assured to benefit all who will ever live. In death, the player would later be in the position to br help bring an end to, the f to a force of unfathomable evil and destruction. A force which was unleashed, for instance, by someone uh, by someone who once opted for the other choice. Yaldabaoth then described what it meant to choose the path of the Conqueror. It was a path for a more active player, to be sure. The player's medal, as a conquering force, would be tested directly and repeatedly. One by one, he would have to conquer and destroy a number of planets spawned for him in the session. Each would be more difficult than the last. After destroying them all, his true land would become unlocked. He would then return to face his denizen again and defeat him in combat. If successful, his reward would be unprecedented. He would receive the boon of unconditional immortality, where resurrection would not be linked with just uh, the uh, with the just or heroic de nature of death. It is unclear how this boon would be awarded, since to my knowledge it is beyond even the ability of a denizen to, do to allow this, but through whatever mechanism the boon is bestowed. Immortality is only the beginning. The player is somehow also imbued with a limitless supply of power, enough to destroy anything he wanted for as long as he wanted. And knowing the villain of our story, anything he wanted would be everything, and as long as he wanted would be forever. Yes, knowing our villain, the choice would be he would make is quite clear. Knowing him, in fact, proves it could hardly be considered a choice at all. It was at this point the real game would begin. Sky would undergo a dramatic transformation, becoming even darker and heavier. Soon, it would become a very massive, solid sphere. Uh, it would begin to generate heat within, within due to rising density. The surface would begin to crack. The resulting explosion is known as the First Break. From the primordial blast would emerge 15 planets for the player to conquer. They would scatter and ricochet at high velocity before settling into orbit in the medium. The break is a very violent phenomenon, though. Not all planets will necessarily clear the blast before the sky and debris settles into, uh, into the, its final state. The vast amount of resulting matter that colla then collapses into a black hole. Its gravitational pull is tremendous. Any object within range will be sucked in and destroyed. Those planets which settle into orbit will be safe, for the time being. But in the case of our villain session, three of the planets did not make it and fell back into the hole. That was a very lucky break for him. It meant that he would only have to conquer 12 planets instead. This bit of good fortune uh, could very well have been the difference which allowed him to overcome the nearly impossible challenge. His task was to destroy all of these planets in order, each within a time allowance that would get short that gets shorter with every planet. To destroy a planet first, it must be conquered. You have to overcome all forces of resistance on the planet and ultimately defeat whatever powerful underling ruled there. Then, much like he did to unlock the quest in the first place, he would have to travel to the planet's core. There, he would retrieve a bomb and return to the surface. If he did not accomplish this in time, the bomb would detonate in the core, and the, the game would be lost automatically. The bomb is not powerful enough to destroy the planet alone. In fact, its purpose is not to damage the planet at all, but to move it. So he must bring it to the designated location on the surface. When it explodes, the planet will be knocked out of orbit and sucked into the hole. Of course, he must make sure he has moved on to the next planet before this happens. It's a lot. He repeats this process for each planet until they are all gone. There is one caveat, though. He must skip the eighth planet. If he sinks the, uh, that one before any of the others, it will result in the destruction of the entire session. Thus, it must be the final planet he conquers. Upon destroying the 8th planet, his true land will reveal itself. The dead planet will, become, will come to life, and there, and there he must prepare for battle with its denizen. He may sharpen his combat skills, craft new weaponry, anything he can do to improve his chances against a very powerful endgame foe. Fortunately for him, he would not have to face the monster alone. By then, he will have accumulated a party of loyal minions. With each planet he destroys, he will be awarded a new Leprechaun follower. Even if a planet was destroyed in the break, he will still be awarded that planet's Leprechaun upon destroying the planet preceding it. Sort of like a two-for-one deal. Wait, Leprechauns? Yes, John. I'm delighted to see you pronounce, uh, pounce on what is clearly the most interesting part of the story thus far. Leprechauns are a fascinating mythical race, although there is some dispute among scholars as to whether they are actually a breed, uh, a breed of gnome. I can't say I blame you for being speechless. There are no doubts hundreds of questions swirling in your head at once about these wonderful creatures. Where do I even begin? You must forgive me. I find it very difficult to resist going on at length about them. I just think they are so great. For instance, I can and have given lectures for weeks at a time on their marvelous and widely uh, varying magical abilities. Well, here it is, Leprechaun Romance. I was wondering where this was. It's fucking 6,000 pages in. Fucking hell. More intriguing yet would be any medium to long from harangue on the topic of their culture and customs, most of which resolve around luck. But most captivating of all, and the subject upon which I will now assidu uh, assiduously expound, will be the positively scintillated subject of Leprechaun Romance. <clears throat> I'm gonna read I'm gonna read this one so I don't have to read it next time. <laughs> 
The problem is that when the subject of love and romance is, is broached, our overly obsessive troll intellects is instantly assume the most ingratiating posture of admiration imaginable, which makes it hard, hard to give it proper academic focus, I mean, because of how great it is. But we will do our best to understand it regardless. Trolls have only four forms of romance, and though we consider it a, a complicated subject, spanning a wide range of emotions, social conventions, and implications for reproduction, it is ultimately a superficial slice of what leprechauns consider the full body of romantic experiences. <clears throat> uh... Our concept of romance, in spite of its cap capacity to fill our art and literature and to rule our individual destinies like little li uh, like little else, is still just that, a single quaternary concept, a concept usually denoted by four symbols, heart, spade, diamond, club. Leprechaun romance is more complicated than that. Leprechaun romance needs nine symbols. The nine quadrants of leprechaun romance are considerably more nuanced than our quaint notions of romance and certainly more alien. In fact, so conditioned is my own understanding of romance that I can't help but prefer refer to them as quadrants when in fact they are not quadrants at all. They are referred to as charms. One of the charms is characterized by romantic love, as understood by both trolls and humans. But after that, all bets are off. There is no division between black or red, concupiscent or conciliatory. Instead, their charms comprise a, a spectral continuum of more subtly varying types of relationships, most of which are established in mutual uh, chicanery, uh, such as the exchange of pranks, coin riddles, slapstick shenanigans, and games of chance. Furthermore, a pair of leprechauns is not limited to a single charm. A relationship may be defined by multiple charms at once. In fact, some of the most interesting relationships arise from exotic charm combinations. A stable relationship which consisting of three or more charms is called a trove. These invasive relationships are often viewed as the ideal end result for our romance, much the way certain pairing rituals are for humans. No term is specifically tied to procreation, though any type of relationship could begin waxing concupiscent if Lady Luck sh should so decide. Certain charm combinations are known to be more conducive to fertility than others. If the leprechaun pair has been so blessed, they will begin an elaborate coupling procedure culminating in a lively mating jig. The jigs are specific to the charm, of course, similar to how different kinds of music lend themselves to various styles of dance. While the romance uh, is endlessly yet captivating, leprechaun reproduction may be the most interesting subject of all, particularly from a perspective of a detailed and an anatomical study, which I will get to shortly. But first, it bears pointing out that while for human reproductive relationships are exclusively heterosexual, and for patrols they are bisexual, for leprechauns they are. Wow, what a story! But I was, but I wasn't. Fin wasn't that the story, great everyone? Wow, <laughs> thank you, Frisco. All right, we're gonna call it there. Page six thousand eight. Ah. Oh. <coughs> Oh, fucking hell. Boy, howdy's right, Ailde. There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot today. Jeezy Pete's. Anyway, so that's 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 it for the stream today, everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for hanging out today and watching and everything. Uh, yeah, it was fun stuff. It was a lot. We finally got to the Leprechaun Romance, which is like one of the last things I remember. I thought Leprechaun Romance was earlier, but it makes sense that it's here. But yeah, so here we go. Anyway, thanks everyone at the chat for hanging out today and chatting it up, watching me read through this absolute just fucking insanity that is this and how always has been for a while now. But if you're watching this on YouTube and you liked it, make sure you click the like button down below. And if you did, be sure to subscribe. New videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Monday and Wednesday are my stream VODs. There's a link down to my Twitch channel in the description below. So you can see times and everything like that. I do have every Sunday or every fourth Sunday off. So every fourth Wednesday also doesn't have one. It's a, it's a, it's a schedule. It's a, it's, a, it's a schedule. There's also a Discord. Uh, there's a link down in the description as well for that. So you can come and join the community of growing that we are putting together and culminating. I don't know what we're coming in towards, but maybe in Horizon, I guess. Um, and comment, what was your favorite part about this? Was it the story of the cherubs, or was it, um, boy, I don't even know, Dave Dave, and Carcat talking, because I fucking love that conversation. It's so funny. <coughs> um, and it's so sweet. It's, like, really, like, bizarrely sweet. And share it with your friends. If you have friends who didn't want to get in the homestead because it's too long of a read, um, Show them this. Show them that they put it on when they're commuting to work, when they're doing work, when they're doing homestuck, when they're just playing video games, whatever. Put it on the background. Have my, have my dulcet tones. I don't know if dulcet applies to my voice, but I'm going to use it. Uh, read them through the absolute batshit insanity that is this, that is this webcomic. Again, thanks everyone in the chat for hanging out today. Um, there is a stream tomorrow. There is a stream tomorrow. <laughs> I'm doing more Danganronpa tomorrow, so I hope to see you all there. But hope everyone has a uh, good day, a good evening, a good morning, whatever time zone you're in. Stay safe. Please stay healthy. Wash your hands. Wear your mask. Drink your water. Eat food. Even if that food happens to be chips and salsa. Whatever it is. Anyway, thanks everyone for hanging out. Stay safe. Hope to see you next time. Later, everybody. Do, 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 do.